Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Daily Planet Book Club, a live stream the live streamed discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. I cannot give you my true name, but you may call me Podcast Hawk. And this is my uh, co-host, Matt Freeman. God damn it! What? You you just you just gave them all my true name. Oh. Uh. Sorry. It's okay. Scott Daly. Okay, now you're just being hurtful. Mutually assured name destruction. <laughs> hey, everybody. And thanks for joining us here tonight. We are live here to discuss another book. And uh, we got Sammy in the chat. I don't see anyone else yet, but I assume more people are coming. I, ho I hope I hope more people are coming. Um, say hi, everybody. Not you, Matt. That's not that's not how this works. Um, if you let us know if you're joining us if, for the first time, if you've ever been here before, or uh, or this is a regular thing for you. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, Matt, I guess I guess we can go ahead and go through like a quick quick primer on how this whole thing works. Sure, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, go for it. Go for okay. it. Okay. So each month, Matt and I select five books that are submitted by you guys and we put up a poll on our patreon account and uh then uh we let our, our patrons vote for the, the book the book with the most votes wins and then we all get it and read it and come here to talk about it um we normally meet up the last friday of every month uh except for this month obviously for reasons um mm -hmm. and then and then we chat about it we pull some slides we dive really deep into some of the writing and the themes and we just we just discuss the book together matt and i lead this discussion but this is this is an interactive conversation with you guys so um we'll be chatting with you guys as you talk in either youtube chat or chat in the discord um we got sierra grau here sergey is here vegeta is here as well and uh i'm pretty excited matt pretty yeah me excited. too if you me are too. If you are listening at home days, weeks, months, or years, years later, I guess that's possible too, Matt. We could be dead. Yeah. Someone's listening to this and we're that's dead true. right now. Yeah. Um, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Wait, starting us off on a high and then it's just going to go downhill from here. I guess so. Well, not before we discuss this month, this month's pick, uh, you guys decided to honor the recently deceased Ursula K. Le Guin with the first book in her Earthsea series, A Wizard of Earthsea. That's the book we're going to be reading today. Yep. So the summary this week, this month, from Goodreads, Ged, the greatest sorcerer in all Earthsea, was called Sparrowhawk in his reckless youth. Hungry for power and knowledge, Sparrowhawk tampered with long-held secrets and loosed a terrible shadow upon the world. This is the tale of his testing, how he mastered the mighty words of power, tamed an ancient dragon and crossed death's threshold to, re to restore the balance. This is a much shorter Goodreads summary than the ones we normally get. Yeah. 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 It, plot wise, the book is actually quite simple. So it makes sense that it could be summarized fairly succinctly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's true. And, and I think that's a great segue into talking about our overall impressions, Matt. Uh, I think neither of us had e ever read a Ursula K. Le Guin book before, right? This is our first experience with the author. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'd read like one one very short story by her before, mm -hmm. which which hardly counts really. Yeah. Um, yeah and I, I I wasn't sure what to expect other than that everyone says, oh, she's one of the great classic writers. She's a great writer. She's great. And I, I don't know how <laughs> I bypassed her my entire life. Right. I mean, it doesn't really like I read all of the Dragon Riders of Prairie books, but I didn't read any of these. These are so much better. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Well, you were young, right? Like we all yes. we all make mistakes in our youth, right? Excellent. Yes. Good. <laughs> it's true. We all in our in our, our youth where we, we think we're so great and we don't need to listen to the advice of our elders and yep. we just buy more and more Dragon Riders of Pern books. <laughs> yeah. Um I I don't know about you. I was very pleasantly surprised by this book. I mean, like, I knew it was gonna be good because it wouldn't be talked about. Ursula K. Le Guin wouldn't be talked about if this was not a good book. But I was kind of surprised at just how much I loved the writing. Um, we're going to get to the slides here in a bit. And I pulled more slides for this book than I have for any of the other ones. And this is, I think, one of the shortest, if not the shortest book we've ever 
done for this podcast. So the fact that I pulled this many slides is just like, I'm just in love with the writing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, you know, I think that the story is, is relatively simple and straightforward. Yeah. The, the themes are actually, well, while, while they're deep, there's, there's not like 15 different themes going on. I think yeah. that she, I think she's very focused in terms of what she's trying to say with this story. And she wastes no space getting to, to saying that. So, uh, yeah, what, what, you, what can be talked about forever is, you know, the, the actual prose, which is what we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sergey says dragon riders is not an Ursula K. Le Guin book. Who wrote I that? know. Uh, Anne McCaffrey. Well, see, I didn't know that. No, and no, they're all they're Anne McCaffrey. My 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 point there was that I had somehow read millions of pages of <laughs> trash fantasy, and no one had ever told me that, <laughs> that, that there were these books. You know, I never knew. I never knew until I was much older. That's great. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, I think. Like I want to, I want to touch on the themes and I want to touch on all this stuff, but I think we got so many slides, Matt, that I think we're going to be able to hit every single one of these beats as we go. All right. So how about we just jump into it? Sounds good to me. All right. So here's the very beginning of the book. It's, I guess it's, this is a song, right? Like the, the creation of, you're going to have to help me with the pronunciations because you listened to the audiobook. Sure. Uh, they didn't. They didn't sing it in the audiobook, but that um, doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's a song. I'm pretty sure it's a song. Yeah, because it's, this... it's all songs here. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's just uh, only in silence the word, only in dark the light, only in dying life bright the hawk's flight on the empty sky, the creation of Aya. Yeah. So Matt, this is like this sets everything up, right? I mean, this yeah. is this is basically defining the themes almost. Like this this idea of only in silence the word, only in dark the light is something that's repeated over and over again as we go throughout the story. This idea of equilibrium, this idea of light and dark, uh, silence and sound, and I like the the hawk's flight on the empty sky is also a kind of equilibrium in itself. It's one thing in the empty sky. Um, I yeah. really like how this started out. I really like it. Yeah, it, it sets up, you know, sort of the metaphysics of the story, and it also somewhat sets up the the character's conflict in the story, which is essentially that in his arrogance, he doesn't understand the truths of these statements. You know, <laughs> he, he doesn't understand this is how it works. He wants yeah. to impose his will. He, he wants there to be more light if he says so, you know? Yeah. And, uh, of course, when you... When you make more light without thinking about balance, you just make more shadow, too. That's true. Hey, Matt, mm -hmm. uh, Vale wants you to sing the song. Well, they didn't sing it in the thing, so I I, I, I mean, it's, this isn't like the other ones where I can sing the tune that they sung on the on the recording, so. <laughs> Matt, make up a song. Make up a song, Matt. Oh, I saw the light, empty sky there. Wow, that that's, good, huh? that's beautiful. Uh -huh. I did, says, you'd appreciate that. Bill says that they it felt like the best wise mom ever reading them a story. Yeah. Which is I think that's that's accurate. Um I, and, I, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say when we talked about this earlier, one of the things I said was like <laughs> in, in my old age I like recognize the deep wisdom of a lot of the stuff from uh from this book. Yeah. Like like the the things that the archmages say or whatever actually strike you as like yes that that is wise actually that's not just like bullshit you know sophistry that that a a not actually smart author put in the mouth of a of a wizard hoping that it would come off as smart yeah and one of the things i i really want to pay attention to as we go through this book is that idea of you and i as 30 something year old men reading this book versus what our interpretation of the story would have been had we read it at 14 or, or 12. Yeah. Um, how, because like, as we, as we see, Ged is kind of an asshole throughout the first half of this book. He's arrogant. He's cocky. He thinks he's better than everyone else and he makes dumb choices for it. And I wonder if someone at that age, as they go through the story would have identified closely, more closely with him and, and the reveal that, actually no everything you're doing is bad would have um 
impacted them a little more because we read it as bad from the start because we're adults and we know that acting like this is bad. Right. And I, I think I probably wouldn't have liked this book nearly as much when I was younger because basically the lesson is stop acting like a fantasy protagonist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's I think that's a good enough excuse to get into it. Okay. With the very first page. First page. Here I go. The island of Gaunt, a sea mountain that lifts its peak a mile above the storm-wracked northeast sea, is a land famous for wizards. From the towns in its high valleys and the ports on its dark and narrow bays, many a Gauntishman has gone forth to serve the lords of the archipelago in their cities as wizard or mage, or, looking for adventure, to wander working magic from isle to isle of all Earthsea. Of these, some say the greatest, and surely the greatest voyager, was the man called the Sparrowhawk, who in his day became both dragon lord and archmage. His life is told in the deed of Ged and in many songs, but this is a tale of the time before his fame, before the songs were made. He was born in a lonely village called Ten Alders, high on the mountain at the head of the northward vale. Below the village, the pastures and plow lands of the vale slope downward level, below level toward the sea, and other towns lie on the bends of the river Ar. Above the village, only forest rises, uh, ride, only forest, right? It's, it's <laughs> a ridge. It's a ridge. It's a typo. Only forest ri <laughs> rises ridge behind ridge. R ridge behind ridge to the stone and snow <laughs> of the heights. The name he bore as a child, Dunny, was given him by his mother, and that and his life were all she could give him, for she died before he was a year old. His father, the bronzesmith of the village, was a grim, unspeaking man, and since Dunny's six brothers were older than he by many years and went one by one from home to farm, to land or sail the sea, or work as a smith in other towns of the northward vale, there was no one to bring the child up in tenderness. He grew wild, a thriving weed, a tall, quick boy, loud and proud and full of temper. So this is Ged, or yep. or or Dooney, or Dunny, whatever. Um, and we we meet our we meet our character, we meet our setting. There's so much going on here. Um, one of the things I like the most about this book, and we can um, we can get into the the mythic nature of this book, the way it is written, as if this is the telling of a tale of myth of thousands of years ago right and i think the way the way it does this by, by basically upfront telling us exactly who this person is going to be we upfront say um there's this guy ged he becomes like the greatest person ever in the future but here's a, a story of before all that and right. one of the things i think that does is is kind of get you into this mindset where this this language kind of works on you because you feel like you're in a mythic storytelling i know you stumbled over the words because one of us uh, missed a a letter in it but the way this is written like if you look at these sentences and and this is how the entire book goes the sentences are very long they use a lot of commas there's a lot of thoughts packed into each one of these sentences there's a lot of repetition um there's level by level ridge by ridge um and even at the bottom when he's talking about his brothers they went one by one from home to farmland there's a lot of this repetition of beats in that way and i think it adds to the, the strength of this prose and the mythic feel of this prose yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of funny because I, I, I also find the prose very beautiful and, and kind of the long, sonorous sentences. Yeah. Like the one the one at the end that I had trouble reading, I had trouble putting the right emphasis on the right syllable because <laughs> like, because you kind of have to, when you you read differently when you read in your head than you, when you read out loud. Right. And, and I hadn't like, I hadn't like chunked the whole sentence yet. But like when you're reading it in your head, it comes off as just purely beautiful and, and like, like like you know like a song almost in, in how it sounds yeah. like it, it sounds really good um and yeah like you said uh none of the awesome like it makes you curious you're like oh this sounds this is going to be very interesting because this ged fellow sounds like quite an accomplished guy i really want to find out about him and your brain kind of forgets that he's not a real person yeah um <laughs> So it's it's a good trick. Yeah, yeah, and and Sergey says something that actually makes me leads me into my my main point of this whole thing is from the first sentence we know he will survive, and just like that, half the stakes are already gone. Um, sorry, but I don't agree. I, I <laughs> like I I have this conversation a lot about stakes and and 
having to having to fear for your main character's life or not. I don't think that's a real thing. Um, I mean, certainly you should feel like your characters are in danger, but the point of the story is not. And 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 by opening this way, it makes it very clear that the point of the story is not is Ged going to survive his encounter with the shadow. The point of the story is is Ged going to grow up and how he is going to grow up. How does he learn these lessons? What happens to him? Um, what happens to you? What decisions did he make? And how did he learn to stop being a whiny little baby man? Yeah, right. I mean, there's there's one famous fantasy series where the person who you think is going to be the main character does die. And that's pretty much all anybody can talk about. So that, that suggests to you how rare that actually is. Right, right. But, um, yeah. But I think, I mean, I think it is very much intentional that you give that away. I mean, not only does it add to the mythic feeling, it, it sets the, the focus of the story on where it needs to be, which is, we know he's great. How did he get there? Where did he yeah. start out? And and there's a whole afterword in the back of this book that's actually really wonderful. Um, if you haven't read it, I suggest you do. But it talks about her whole her whole idea behind the story was, we know the old wizened wizard. We know that guy. We see him. We got Gandalf. Um, we know him. But what was he like when he was a kid? How did he get to the wizened wizard state? What, what was he like when he was my age? And I think that's what this book explores. Yeah, that's really interesting. All right, next slide. A sister of his dead mother lived in the village. She had done what she, what was needful for him as a baby, but she had business of her own, and once he could look after himself at all, she paid no more heed to him. But one day, when the boy was seven years old, untaught, and knowing nothing of the arts and powers that are in the world, he heard his aunt crying out words to a goat which had jumped up onto the thatch of a hut and would not come down. But it came jumping down when she cried a certain rhythm to it, rhyme to it. Next day, herding the long-haired goats on the meadows of Highfall, Dooney shouted to them the words he had heard, not knowing their use or meaning or what kind of words they were. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher this. Nath Hark Malman, Hokan Murthan. He yelled the rhyme aloud, and the goats came to him. They came very quickly, all of them together, not making a sound. They looked at him out of the dark slots in their yellow eyes. Dooney laughed and shouted out again, the rhyme that gave him power over goats. They came closer, crowding and pushing round him. All at once, he felt afraid of their thick, rigid horns and their strange eyes and their strange silence. He tried to get free of them and to run away. The goats ran with him, keeping a knot around him. And so they came charging down into the village at last, all the goats huddling together as if a rope were pulled tightly round them, and the boy in the midst of them weeping and bellowing. Villagers ran from their houses to swear at the goats and laugh at the boy. Among them came the boy's aunt, who did not laugh. So this is, uh, this is our boy's first experience with magic, Matt. And, yeah. and surprise, surprise, he is doing something he doesn't understand that he does not understand the consequences of and must be saved from someone else, by someone else. This, this yeah. In this case, his aunt. Right. He just he enjoys having the power and then it immediately has a cost and leaves him comically blubbering in the town square. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is something that happens again and again. Yeah. And I mean, like, this is a story of uh, of, of growing up. This is a story of becoming a man and i love that we start we start it small we start the same kind of mistakes a child would make without magic like just doing something he didn't understand not understanding the consequence of it getting himself in trouble and having to be saved by a, a parental figure and that's that we're going to hit this beat over and over again throughout the story but each time get is older and therefore the consequences are worse and that's yep. that's it's kind of like what growing up is Yep, well said. All right. Um, all right, moving on. Yeah, so that, so between this slide and our next one, um, Ged is basically taught all basic magic spells by his aunt and any other sorcerers that happen to walk through the air, area. Um, he has great proficiency with it. He picks it up easily, and he's really good at it. And then one day, an invading army shows up on their shores. And they're on their way up the mountain to pillage and burn his hometown. That's right. He looked down at his thin arms, wet with cold fog dew, enraged at his weakness, for he knew his strength. There was power in him, if he knew how to use it, and he sought among all the spells he knew for some device that might give him and his companions an advantage, or at least a chance. But need alone is not enough to set power free. There must be knowledge. 
The fog was thinning now under the heat of the sun that shone bare above the peaks in that in a bright sky. As the mists moved and parted in great drifts and smoky wisps, the villagers saw a band of warriors coming up the mountain. They were armored with bronze helmets and greaves and breastplates of heavy leather and shields of wood and bronze, and armed with swords and the long cargish lance. Winding up along the steep bank of the Ar, they came in a plumed, cranking, straggling line, near enough already that their white faces could be seen, and the words of their jargon heard as they shouted to one another. In this band of the invading horde, there were about a hundred men, which is not many, but in the village were only eighteen men and boys. Now need called knowledge out. Dooney, seeing the fog blow thin across the path before the cargs, saw a spell that might avail him. An old weather worker of the Vale, seeking to win the boy as prentice, had taught him several charms. One of these tricks was called fog weaving, a binding spell that gathers the mist together for a while in one place. With it, one skilled in illusion can shape the mist into fair ghostly seemings, which last a little and fade away. The boy had no such skill, but his intent was different, and he had the strength to turn the spell to his own ends. Rapidly and aloud, he, claimed, he named the places and the boundaries of the village, and then spoke the fog-weaving charm. But in among its words, he enlaced the words of a spell of concealment. And last, he cried the word that set the magic going. So here it is, Matt. His big accomplishment that gets everyone's attention. And yeah. the end almost kills him. Uh, right. Yeah, this, I mean, this, the entire fog scene, I think, we, we only could pick out the very beginning of it, but this, this is a whole sequence that kind of goes on where, like, um, his fog people are, like, whispering to the soldiers as they come and they, like, scare some of them off a cliff and, and scare them all away. It's, it's very powerful magic. And, uh, Sammy says that he really liked this fog scene. Yeah, me too. It's, I mean, I kind of want to say it's cinematic, but I don't know what I mean by that. I, I think what I mean is I found it very easy to visualize. Um, but it's actually not very cinematic because it's just white. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but like it's very easy to you have a you have this firm grasp and and it's very it's extremely exciting. It's extremely uh, just just well written. Yeah, it is well written. But like I, it's it's and this is throughout the book. It's well written in a way that's like it's almost like I, I mean it, it it's it it's mythic. So it's almost like reading like like your Edith Hamilton Greek mythology book. A lot of this stuff is just matter of factly. Like it's just relaying facts to you. Like that's the way it's it's kind of presented. It's like, okay, then he did this, um, then he did that. And I I, I like it. Um but it is like I I could see how on an emotional level people would be able would not be able to connect to this prose. I could see that. Yeah. Um I guess I guess I agree. Like I guess that's what was surprising to me is that she's using a sort of prose style that you might associate with Tolkien or something. Like yeah, yeah. one thing that stuck out here was when she was like he was searching for a spell that would avail him. It's like that's that's such Gandalf language. Yeah. yeah. Um but also like through this styling she's she's speaking with a a very immediate you know active voice and and moving the plot forward and being very clear with everything like she's not just picking these words to sound good you know she's she's also picking them because they're the right word no I for what she's trying to do yeah i completely agree with that absolutely um and and the thing i like most about this this part and kind of why i, I pulled this out specifically um was this idea that need alone is not enough to set power free there must be knowledge which is mm -hmm. stated above but then at the bottom now need called the knowledge out. And I think that's a kind of an interesting uh, comparison there that the, like, it's not enough to just need something. You need to know something. But then in, in, in Dooney's greatest need, that need pulled out knowledge. Yeah. And the knowledge was inside him. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I honestly, I view this as a sort of response to the bad fantasy trope of just like, you know, the, the the main character was standing on the hill with the evil forces below him and then he was suddenly filled up with light and a flaming sword appeared in his hand and he struck them down and he knew he was the chosen one like Ged isn't Ged doesn't know he's the chosen one right he's just right. like oh he, he's really powerful and 
part of power in this world is actually just intelligence because you have to be able to memorize all these things. Yeah. And you have to have some like innate power level, which is never really specified how that works. Yeah. But but mainly like it seems mainly to be the fact that he just can memorize everything he hears, which is, you know, helpful in this world. Right. Um, like, so it's his, it's his knowledge that actually saves him here. It's not some birthright, I think. Absolutely. Like need called knowledge out. It's not that it's not yeah. that he didn't know this stuff. He just had he just had forgotten it. And yeah. th- need became enough to where he remembered it. A- absolutely. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and th- w- there's a lot of chat going on in both the Discord and the YouTube chat right now about the book and the writing style. And there's talking about um, it, it's it is it, this book came out and I think it was 1962. 1967 in the 60s so this is an older book um the genre was not as well tread as it is today and i think she's doing something a little bit unique here and and i think i think tolkien is a uh, tolkien is a great comparison Mm -hmm. um and and a bird says it sometimes felt like she was stating the obvious but that's sort of necessary for a moral tale which i think is a really good point sigrog makes the comparison to the seinfeld is unfunny effect where um People, people who were first watching Seinfeld in 2018 might say it's not funny, but that's because they, everything they've watched since then was influenced by Seinfeld. Similarly, Le Guin was so like foundationally impactful to the genre that I think a lot of the stuff that we're reading, like there were certain things in this book that, like very, very minor things, like for example, the goats. I was like, I wonder if the stuff in The Magicians about the goats isn't like, <laughs> isn't like based because kind of the language is kind of similar i was like i wonder if he's paying homage to this i I mean my point is just like this definitely influenced things that we have read even though we haven't read this yeah yeah sergey asked but didn't the book treat his power as the reason that we should care about him um kind of i mean we we claim we we define him as a powerful wizard in the first page um, that is true. He and and we reinforce that throughout. He is gifted. He is blessed with power. That is absolutely true. Um, but but that that is not all that he is. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe we have a bit. Maybe we'll get a better opportunity to talk about that later on because I feel like the nature of what is pow- like what is power in this world is tied into who you are as a person. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're right. Yeah. Like you can't extricate the two. Yeah. So. All right. So Ged is almost dead after this. He basically expends all his power to do this one thing. And then, uh, how do you pronounce this guy's name, Matt? You would listen to the audiobook. Ogion? Ogion? Ogion is actually what they said, okay. which is like the last thing that I would have said, but yeah, Ogion. I like that better though. Okay. Uh, so Ged is healed by Ojayan, a powerful sorcerer who heard of his exploit and tra- exploits and travel to the town. Um, he heals him and then promises to return and name the child and take him on as an apprentice. And this is his this is his naming ceremony. On the day the boy was thirteen years old, a day in the early splendor of autumn, while still the bright leaves are in the, on the trees, Ojayan returned to the village from his roving over Gaunt Mountain, and the ceremony of passage was held. The witch took the boy his took from the boy his name Dooney, the name his mother had given him as a baby. Nameless and naked, he walked into the cold springs of the Ar, where it rises among rocks under the high cliffs. As he entered the water, clouds crossed the sun's face, and great shadows slid and mingled over the water of the pool about him. He crossed to the far bank, shuddering with cold, but walking slow and erect, as he, sh- as he sh- should through that icy, icy living water. Blech. As he came to the bank, Ojayan waiting, reached out his hand, and clasping the boy's arm, whispered to him his true name, Ged. Thus he was given his name by one very wise in the uses of power. The feasting was far from over, and all the villagers were making merry with plenty to eat and beer to drink and a chanter from down the vale singing the deed of the dragon lords. But when the mage spoke in his quiet voice to Ged, Come, lad, bid your people farewell, and leave them feasting. Ged fetched what he had to carry, which was the good bronze knife, knife his father had forged him, and a leather coat the tanner's widow had cut down to his size, and an elder stick his aunt had becharmed for him. That was all he owned beside his shirt and breeches. He said farewell to them, all the people he knew in the world, and looked about once and looked about once at the village that straggled and huddled there under the cliffs over the river springs. Then he set off with his new master through the steep, slanting forests of the mountain isle, 
through the leaves and shadows of bright autumn. All right, so this is the first introduction in the book of the importance of names and naming things. And when we, we will get more in detail uh, as we go through the story, but this is kind of our, our first preview of it, which is, which is something that Le Guin does here that is not new. Like there have been many cultures and societies throughout history on this planet that, that believed in the power of names and naming things. And it's been kind of something that's been passed down through stories and folklore and myths for years. And she kind of took that basic concept as the, the, the basic like founding factor of her world in Earthsea. Yeah. Um, so, so this character of giant, I, I, are we going to get into him a little bit more because he, he's a fascinating example of like, he, he, he's kind of her like Gandalf in this story, you know, he, yeah. he's, he is, he is the, the wise wizard that we get to see in, in the most detail. And I think he portrays probably the closest thing to like her idea of what a wise master actually looks like and behaves like. Yeah. I, I think we are going to get at him more. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I, I found him very fascinating. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to point out here was this last paragraph. And I like, like there's, there's, there's a lot of imagery here and the idea around the idea of, of growing up. Right. Cause that's one of the things the story is, is very much about, but the idea of leaving behind the people you knew to, to seek out new things and different experiences. And I like that the tokens that the things that he takes with him are one, um, his bronze knife, that's the connection to his father. Then he's got the, the Tanner's widow gave him a leather coat. And then lastly, his aunt, the only other person he knew. So he's got these three trophies from these three people and he's taking these things and leaving and he never sees these people again, as far as we know, um, at least in this story, maybe, maybe in, in later stories of Ged, he'll run into these people again. But um, I, I like the imagery of taking a token from each of them and then leaving. Yeah, yeah, me too. I also like how, I don't know if this is a coincidence that you happen to pull these paragraphs out, but like the first paragraph begins on, on the day he was 13, a day in the early splendor of autumn while still the bright leaves are on the trees. And then it, and then it ends through the leaves and shadows of bright autumn. So it's, it's very interesting that she's bracketing and um, she, she's bracketing this sort of like story fragment with this visual imagery of the the trees the brightness of 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 uh of autumn and and it, like she never gives you an aside where she's like it was it was late autumn there were leaves on the trees <laughs> the sun was bright it's it's all it's all worked in and it, and it's also bracketing the the text so i think that's interesting yeah you caught that right i i did i did do that on purpose in this one. Oh, cool yeah. okay Zach in the chat says, I think it's important that she portrays Ojayan as wise rather than powerful. We know that Sparrowhawk has plenty of power. What his teacher needs to teach him is the wisdom. That is absolutely true. And uh, Ojayan basically says as much to him like four times. But yeah. but Ged is Ged and does not listen at all. Right. Um, so, yeah. So uh, we have Ged leaves and and arrives at it um oh no sorry i i jumped ahead we've got we've got his first lesson that he learns on the on the journey to a giant's home yeah you want to work spells o giant said presently striding along you've drawn too much water from that well wait manhood is patience mastery is nine times patience what is that herb by the path straw flower and that i don't know Fourfoil, they call it. Ojayan had halted the copper-shod foot of his staff near the little weed, so Ged looked closely at the plant and plucked a dry seed pod from it and finally asked, since Ojayan, Ojayan said nothing more, What is its use, master? None I know of. Ged kept the seed pod a while as they went on, then tossed it away. When you know the fourfoil in all its seasons, root and leaf and flower, by sight and scent and seed, then you may learn its true name, knowing its being, which is more than its use. What, after all, is the use of you, or of myself? Is Gaunt Mountain useful, or the open sea? Ojayan went on half a mile or so, and said at last, To hear, one must be silent. The boy frowned. He did not like to be made a f to feel a fool. 
He kept back his resentment and impatience and tried to be obedient so that Ojayan would consent at least to teach him something, for he hungered to learn, to gain power. It began to seem to him, though, that he could have learned more walking with any herb gatherer or any village sorcerer, and as they went round the mountain westward into the lonely forest pass Wis, he wondered more and more what was the greatness and the magic of this great mage Ojayan. So this is, I, I love this so much. Um, because this is, Ojayan is teaching him, and he's teaching him, and and Ged is just not, is just not getting it. He's just not yeah. understanding. And and the lesson is here. The, this lesson of, of what is its use? Like what things in this world are not just what they can be of use to you. They're not just what they can do for you. What what is the use of you? I love that. What is the use of you yeah. or myself? Is Gaunt Mountain useful or the open sea? Are these things useful? Sometimes, but they are also things. And yeah. to hear, one must be silent. And that's that dichotomy. That's that equilibrium that we get in the poem at the beginning and this idea of light and dark. And and frankly, the idea of earth sea, right? This this land is like this dichotomy between two different things, earth and sea. And Ojayan is teaching him here. And, and I love Ged's reaction. It's such a perfect childhood reaction. He's just given him a lesson here. And all Ged can focus on is that he was he he felt embarrassed. He did not like to be made to feel a fool, and that's not he was that's not what he was doing. He was not trying to embarrass him. He was trying to teach him. Yeah, what's what's interesting, and I think this has to do, like I said earlier, with like the nature of magic in this world, is that uh, Ojain is trying to teach him, you know wisdom and, and, and how to be a good person and just like good life advice. Right. But he, he, he is also simultaneously teaching him about magic and how magic works. But just, because... not, the, just not the way he wants to learn magic. He wants the tricks. Right. He wants the illusions. He wants to do the things that will impress people. He doesn't want to understand the magic, at least not yet. Right. At this point, and, and probably for most of the story, he, he thinks that magic is just like memorizing the the, the true names of things and, and the, the incantations. Right. And uh, that's not that's not the that's not the, the the depth of it. Like that's not how the actual high level mages actually actually think of it. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. So now he arrives at at Ojain's house and uh, spends most of his time going out and picking herbs. And is really frustrated by by it. He says Ojayan has taught him nothing of magic, and he's frustrated. And then one day he meets a young girl who kind of uh, harries him to to prove his power. And uh, so he decides to impress her with some magic to prove he's powerful. Spurred on by this pride and this girl that he's trying to impress, he uh, he sneaks into into the house and steals one of Ojayan's powerful spell books, and then decides to read it. As he read it, puzzling out the runes and symbols one by one, a horror came over him. His eyes were fixed, and he could not lift them till he had finished reading all the spell. Then raising his head, he saw it. It was dark in the house. Had he been reading with... He had been reading without any light in the darkness. He could not now make out the runes when he looked down at the book. Yet the horror grew over him, seeming to hold him bound in his chair. He was cold. Looking over his shoulder, he saw that something was crouching beside the closed door. A shapeless clot of shadow, darker than darkness. It seemed to reach out towards him, and to whisper, and to call to him in a whisper, but he could not understand the words. The door was flung wide. A man entered with white light flaming about him, a great bright figure who spoke aloud, fiercely and suddenly. The darkness and the whispering ceased and were dispelled. The horror went out of Ged, but he still he was mortally afraid. For it was Ojayan the mage who stood there in the doorway with the brightness all about him, and the oaken staff in his hand burned with a white radiance. Saying no word, the mage came past Ged and lighted the lamp and put the books away on the shelf. Then he turned to the boy and said, You will never work this, that spell but in peril of your, of your power and your life. Was it for that spell you opened the books? No, master, the boy murmured, and shamefully he told Ojayan what he had sought and why. So this is our first hint at the shadow to come. And here's Ojayan specifically teaching him something again. Don't read that spell again. It's going to be bad. Yeah. It's bad news, that spell. Don't do it. So am I interpreting, right, like he, does, he doesn't even read it out loud, right? He just, Correct. 
he just reads it and there's still this manifestation even though he doesn't like cast the spell yeah um i i, I was trying to maybe i'm being too like literal with the book here but i was like how based on my understanding of how stuff works in this world why why does the shadow appear just because he's like like it's like something something is forcing him to read the spell all the way through some darkness so is that is that like the darkness within him is already manifesting yeah i mean that that's my interpretation of it is is he, his power is growing as he ages and he's i, I think a, a lot of a lot of what the 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 magic that you do in this world is based off intent, right? I think the archmage specifically tells him that. So like every time he does something with the intent of um, pride or selfishness or lust for power, bad things happen. So he opened the spell book with the intent of to show off, to, to be powerful and darkness. And, and that, that cast his shadow kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think I follow you there. Yeah. And it does say Ged Ged is like, as a bird says, Ged is puzzling out the runes as he is saying them. Um, I think I think a bird is arguing that he is reading it aloud. Although I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know if I remember that or not. Even if he is, though, he doesn't he doesn't cast it because we don't see like an apparition. Because the point of it is to summon the dead, right? right. And he doesn't doesn't actually do that. So right. at, at worst, he's like senseless, like sort of slowly reading them out loud, but not. I don't think that's the same as casting. So yeah. I, I think I think you're I think you're right that like it's just he's he's manifesting his own poor nature through his power by by doing this thing he shouldn't be doing. Yeah, yeah, and and once again, once again, Matt Ojayan comes and saves him from his own mistake because that is that is being a child is getting to make mistakes without too bad of consequences and that slowly goes away as you age as as the choices you make become more serious and more adult the consequences of those choices become more serious and more adult and that's kind of what we're seeing throughout the story so far at first he was just being harried by goats and then he summoned too much power and almost died and here he summoned a thing a terrible thing that he didn't fully understand yeah it's definitely and this is now that this is the second or more time this has happened definitely worth talking about the theme that um he would be so dead if it weren't for other people saving his ass repeatedly again and again and again yeah yeah um and i think that's saying something about how like you can't actually become a great man without relying on other people yeah kind of makes sense mm -hmm. yeah absolutely okay um next slide okay yeah so at this point Let's see, where are we? This is this is Ged after after the uh he's he's yelling back at Ojayan and Ojayan basically gives him a choice. Yeah, okay. Driven by his shame, Ged cried, How am I to know these things when you teach me nothing? Since I lived with you I have done nothing, seen nothing. Now you have seen something, said the mage, by the door in the darkness when I came in. Ged was silent. A giant knelt down and built the fire on the hearth and lit it, for the house was cold. Then, still kneeling, he said in his quiet voice, Ged, my young falcon, you are not bound to me or to my service. You did not come to me, but I to you. You are very young to make this choice, but I cannot make it for you. If you wish, I will send you to Roke Island, where all high arts are taught. Any craft you undertake to learn, you will learn, for your power is great. Greater even than your pride, I hope. I would keep you here with me for what I have is what you lack, but I will not keep you against your will. Now choose between Ray Albi and Roke. Ged stood dumb, his heart bewildered. He had come to love this man, Ojayan, who had healed him with a touch and who had, been, who had no anger. He loved him and had not known it until now. He looked at the oaken staff leaning in the, sh the chimney corner, remembering the radiance of it that had burned out evil from the dark, and he yearned to stay with Ojayan, to go wandering through the forest with him, long and far learning how to be silent yet other cravings were in him that would not be stilled the wish for glory the will to act a giant's seemed a long road towards mastery a slow bypath to follow when he came when he might go sailing before the sea winds straight to the inmost sea 
to the Isle of the Wise, where the air was bright with enchantments and the Archmage walked amidst wonders. Master, he said, I will go to Roke. So he makes the decision here. The decision that he, of course, is going to make that I think any child would make, which right. is go with the one that, that demands patience, that demands a slow accumulation of wisdom or go to the place that promises to teach you how to do tricks and illusions. Yeah. You've got to be pretty old and genre savvy to recognize that you should, you should definitely stay with Dumbledore at this point. (laughs) Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, But, but, and I love, I love the conflict. I love that we, we see his kind of slow growth throughout the book and he still hasn't done the worst thing he's done yet, but he is aware enough here to recognize that he does love this man and he, and he knows that this man is powerful. Like he, he glances at the, at the, the staff leaning against the chimney corner, remembering the radiance of that, that had burned out the evil from the dark. He remembers that this man does have power, that this power he was waiting to see in him is here. It's just not going to happen soon. And it's not fast enough. And, that's why that's why he he that's why his decision is made for him um yeah right you get the sense that uh, like you said any young person would make this choice and it, it it's barely even a choice for him like right. he's like oh this that's a shame oh well <laughs> yeah and i think yeah. this i think this does something that is important to the book as a whole um i think the fact that ojian leaves this decision up to him, offers the decision to him. Because we see here that Ged almost didn't even realize that this was an option. Like he says, Ged stood dumb, his heart bewildered. He didn't know that he could do that. He didn't know that he could just say, hey, I want to go to the place with all the wizards. Um, and and so that the importance is that that the choice is made by you. The lesson is 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 learned by you. Um, you can you can receive guidance and receive teaching, and he does throughout the course of this book. But at the end of the day, he has to figure it out. He has to make the choice. He has to make the decision. And I think that's something that Ojayan, in his wisdom here, recognizes. Yeah, I agree. All right, so. He is going to Roke, and now we flash forward to him being in Roke because it's just a bunch of sailing. I cut out a lot of the sailing, Matt. Um, I mean, I understand travel is necessary, but there's not a lot. There's not a lot of stuff to say about about sailing. That's a good good call yeah. there. Vale says in chat, uh, "Wisdom is a thing you gain after you needed it," which is, I like that. Yeah, that's that's great because I was just thinking I was. I was thinking, um, would Ged have become this great dragon lord archmage if he had stayed with Ojayan and been been humble and learned patience and learned to listen? You know, that's an interesting um, question. Yeah, and and I don't I don't know. You know, there's no actual answer that there may be like a answer that would be endorsed by Ursula K. Le Guin, but I I don't know what that would be yeah. if so. I would think no. Um because i think i think part of what this book is saying is that youth is about making mistakes like like i i don't think i don't think the book necessarily admonishes him for his mistakes i think he it just acknowledges that he makes them and says that he needs to learn from them and grow yeah well and and the way the book ends he couldn't have have performed that like mastery of himself if he hadn't made that original mistake right yeah yeah so yeah uh, you are you are your mistakes, your shadows, just as much as you are your successes. So like let's it. let's get back let's get back to Roke. That night, as he lay wrapped in his cloak on a mattress in his cold, unlit cell of stone, in the utter silence of the great house of Roke, the strangest strangeness of the place and the thought of all the spells and sorceries that had been worked there began to come over him heavily. Darkness surrounded him, dread filled him. He wished he were anywhere else but Roke. But Vetch came to the door, a little bluish ball of werelight nodding over his head to light the way, and asked if he could come in and talk a while. He asked Ged about Gaunt, and then spoke fondly of his own home miles in the East Reach, telling how the smoke of village hearthfires is blown across the quiet sea at at evening between the Mall Islands with funny names, Corp, Cop, and Holp, Venway, and Vemish, Ifish, 
Kapish, and Sneg. When he sketched the shape of those islands on the stone stones of the floor with his finger to show Ged how they lay, the lines he drew shone dim, as if drawn with a stick of silver, for a while before they faded. Vetch had been three years at the school, and soon would be made sorcerer. He thought no more of performing the lesser arts of magic than birds think of flying. Yet a greater unlearned skill he possessed, which was that of kind which was the art of kindness. That night, and always from then on, he offered and gave Ged friendship, and sh- a sure and open friendship with Ged, which Ged could not help but return. Man, a lot of typos this time, Matt. I'm sorry. It's okay. A lot of, a lot of typing, too. Yeah. Yet Vetch was also friendly to Jasper, who had made Ged into a fool on his first day in Roke Knoll. Ged would not forget this, nor, it seemed, would Jasper, who always spoke to him with a polite voice and mocking smile. Ged's pride would not be slighted or condescended to. He swore to prove to Jasper and all the rest of them, among whom Jasper was something of a leader, how great his power really was. Someday. For none of them, for all their clever tricks, had saved a village by wizardry. Of none of them had Ojayan written that he would be the greatest wizard of Gaunt. So this is just Ged being a dick. Yeah. So so can we? Are we <laughs> uh, we haven't talked about this yet, but are, are we on the same page that uh, Jasper is it Jasper? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jasper did nothing wrong at all, and. And uh, Ged is just so oversensitive that he like just misinterpreted Jasper's tone at one point and then decided that Jasper hated him and then decided that Jasper's like neutral face ex- facial expression must be a mocking smile and not just like that's how his face looks or something. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that Ged is reading too much into it. Um, th- their their initial meeting is so funny because Ged... Ged Jasper is this like highborn, raised and um, coddled person that has had this kind of charmed life, and Ged is is been poor his entire life. And Ged is kind of says something mean to Jasper before Jasper does. It's like, yeah. like I think he shows him to his his cell, and he was like, um, "You probably be okay here, right?" Like. And he, he immediately comes back with his like, oh, I bet you were in way nicer places than this. And it's like, whoa, Ged. I think yeah. that Ged is very much threatened by the idea that someone else could be good at this stuff. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I think that, that Ged draws first blood here. Yeah. And I, th- I think eventually Jasper does come to dislike him, but it's largely motivated by Ged being consistently rude to him. Yeah, I think you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, I... I I wanted to pull that out. That that part at the end is very important, but his friendship with Vetch is very important too. Um, and I like that th- there's this there's this feeling, there's this thing that happens to Ged again and again throughout the story, which is whenever he's at a place of darkness, of loneliness, of despair, something comes to him, someone or something comes to him, and it's Vetch a lot of the times, and and we'll see Vetch again in in, in a moment where where Ged is sitting there lonely and not sure what to do next, suddenly Vetch is there, magically. Um, it's a little bit of a catastrophic moment, but um, that, that Ged has a very charmed life, and it's charmed because of, a lot, because of the people around him. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great point. So this, this next bit, um, I, like, I like how you annotated this slide. <laughs> Everyone keeps trying to teach Ged shit, but he doesn't listen because he's Ged. (laughs) Sir, all these charms are much the same. Knowing one, you know them all. And as soon as the spell weaving ceases, the illusion vanishes. Now if I make a pebble into a diamond, and he did so with a word and a flick of his wrist, what must I do to make that diamond remain diamond? How is the changing spell locked and made to last? The master hand looked at the jewel that glittered on Ged's palm, bright as the prize of a dragon's hoard. The old master murmured one word, Tolk, and there lay the pebble, no jewel but a rough gray bit of rock. The master took it and held it out on his own hand. This is rock, Tolk in the true speech, he said, looking mildly up at Ged now. A bit of the stone of which Roke Island is made, a little bit of the dry land on which men live. It is itself, it is part of the world. By the illusion change, you can make it look like a diamond, or a flower, or a fly, or an eye, or a flame. The rock flickered from shape to shape as he named them, and then returned to rock. 
But that is mere seeming. Illusion fools the beholder's senses. It makes him see and hear and feel the thing is changed. But it has not changed the thing. To change this rock into a jewel, you must change its true name. And to do that, my son, even to so small a scrap of the world, is to change the world. It can be done. Indeed, it can be done. It is the art of the master changer, and you will learn it when you are ready to learn it. But you must not change one thing, one pebble, one grain of sand, until you know what good and evil will follow on the act. The world is in balance, in equilibrium. A wizard's power of changing and of summoning can shake the balance of the world. It is dangerous, that power. It is most perilous. It must follow knowledge and serve need. To like a candle, it, it like to like it's a candle supposed is supposed to be light. <laughs> to light a candle is to cast a shadow. Yeah. So I the, my my annotation was exactly right here because every everything Ged needs to know about the spell that he's going to cast later is here. Um, to light a candle is to cast a shower. Uh, a shadow um so he, he's the shadow is defined here the shadow is created by his power by his attempt to change something in the world um not to serve need not following knowledge uh threatening equilibrium and and it's all here and and there's a part in this whole conversation that i didn't pull but after this entire speech the master hand says to him and besides a rock is valuable a rock has purpose What's wrong with a rock? Why do you need to change it? And that's something that completely, completely, does, he doesn't heed. Yeah, yeah, right. He, he, he hasn't he hasn't heard a single word of, of any of this idea of, of equilibrium and thinking through the consequences of your actions, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's all it's all a metaphor for I think how people really do behave when they're young and foolish. Is there are lots of things in life that that are power basically mm -hmm. like you can you can affect another person with just your words right mm -hmm. like that, that that's that's almost like magic you know you can you can either you can either make someone feel really good or make someone feel terrible with just your words yeah. and that's that's our nor that's our normal world and and when you're young especially you tend to use that power very recklessly um and only learn that you shouldn't do that usually by making terrible mistakes yeah. so yeah. I mean, it's a metaphor that works in multiple ways. That's that's just one that seems really yeah. obvious. Yeah, I like that part a lot. Um, you must not change one thing, one pebble, one grain of sand until you know what good and evil will follow the act. Choices should not be made until you understand the consequences, which is true of magic <laughs> and of life. Yeah. And it's interesting because like, there, there is the argument that that he left Ojayan because he wanted to come here and and learn cool spells and effects. But but these masters are trying to teach him stuff that is very similar to Ojayan's, right? I mean, they are they are trying to teach him um, to be wise, but they are also kind of um, feeding his lust for power at the same time. Yeah. Right. It, it seems like all of the wizards on this island are indeed wise, but also like part of their job and, and the function of their order is to teach all all that they know about magic. Yeah. So, yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> it is interesting because you would think that if they were truly wise and they would all just be like, no, you carry water up the stairs for ten years, and then we'll, <laughs> and then we'll start teaching you spells. You know, yeah, like yeah. So, well, I mean, we're gonna see, we're gonna see how how their wisdom fails in a bit. Mm -hmm. But first, we gotta meet our friendly familiar. Um, this is when Ged meets Hoeg. How did it, how did it, how was it pronounced in the audiobook? Oh, man, you don't even remember. I don't. Okay, I don't. Well, it, it was one of these things where, where every time he said it, I was like, I wonder how that's spelled because that doesn't <laughs> seem like any language that I know of. <laughs> Sergey asks, can you set something on fire with illusion of fire? Um, I don't think so, right? I think yeah, I don't think you can with illusions. There's specifically illusions and then summoning from the powers of the world, which are, are yeah. two different things, yeah. I think that you could use magic to set something on fire, but yeah. not, not with an illusion yeah. spell. <laughs> And Funky replies, no, but you can make some sick burns. Nice. 
All right. So this next slide. This is uh, Ged is leaving the Tower of the Names where he spent a year, right? Just learning names for things. Um, uh -huh. So he's leaving that and heading back to the rest of the school. He walked south across the island alone in the early winter along townless empty roads. As night came on, it rained. He said no charm to keep the rain off him, for the weather of Roke was in the hands of the master wind key and might not be tampered with. He took shelter under a great pendic tree, and lying there wrapped in his cloak, he thought of his old master Ogian, who might still be in, on his autumn wanderings over the heights of Gaunt, sleeping out with leafless branches for a roof and falling rain for house walls. That made Ged smile, for he found the thought of Ogian always, always a comfort to him. He fell asleep with a peaceful heart there in the cool darkness full of the whisper of water. At dawn waking, he lifted his head. The rain had ceased, he saw, sheltered in the folds of his cloak, a little animal curled up asleep which had crept there for warmth. He wondered, seeing it, for it was a rare, strange beast, an Otak. These creatures are found only on four so southern isles of the archipelago. Archipelago, God. <laughs> Roke, Ensmer, Potty, and what Wet Hort. They are small and sleek, with broad faces and fur dark brown or brindle, and great bright eyes. Their teeth are cruel, and their temper fierce, so they are not made pets of. They have no call or cry or any voice. Ged stroked this one, and it woke and yawned, showing a small brown tongue and white teeth. But it was not afraid. Otak, he said, and then remembering the thousand names of beasts he had learned in the tower, he called it by its true name in the old speech. Hoeg. Do you want to come with me? The Otak sat itself down on his open hand and began to wash its fur. He put it on his shoulders in the folds of his hood, and there it rode. Sometimes during the day it jumped down and darted off in the woods, but it always came back to him. Once with a wood mouse it had caught. So this is his familiar, and I think it's really important to look at this, Matt, and this is why I pulled it, because the familiar comes to him at the moment he is peacefully falling asleep remembering his former master almost as if the thing was sent to protect him by his former master and we never really get any kind of literal confirmation of that but i don't think it's an accident that he falls asleep he's walking through weather getting rained on which is something he complained about that his master was doing is like why would you let yourself get rained on it doesn't make any sense he's not casting spells he's not using magic to solve minor problems and he's peacefully remembering his, ma his former master, and this thing comes to him. And this thing will save his life so many times before, before the end. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's neat because it's just another, another being that, that involves itself with him and, and loves him and takes care of him. But it's not like the magical familiars in this world, you know, can talk or teleport or anything. You know, they're just sort of an animal that that loves him mm -hmm. yeah. i, I kind of like that actually yeah i do too and then he, he dies he dies and then he, he dies very sad. sadly yeah very sadly yes couldn't believe they went there i could of course they went there you always got to kill the familiar is that true i mean i'm i'm thinking of a book that i don't want to tell you about because it'll oh, spoil okay. something for you but okay all right let's Let's not go there. Let's just accept that the world is full of sadness and move on. All right. And this next slide, Ged is super powerful, so get special training. Yeah. All right. He was 15, very young to learn of the high arts of wizard or mage, those who carry the staff. But he was so quick to learn all the arts of illusion that the master changer himself, a young man, soon began to teach him apart from the others and to tell him about the true spells of shaping. He explained how, if a thing is really to be changed into another thing, it must be renamed for as long as the spell lasts. And he told how this effect affects the names and natures of things surrounding the transformed thing. He spoke of the perils of changing, above all when the wizard transforms his own shape and thus is liable to be caught in his own spell. Little by little, drawn by the boy's sureness of understanding, the young master began to do more than merely tell him of these mysteries. He taught him first one and then another of the great spells of change, and he gave him the book of shaping to study. This he did without knowledge of the archmage, and unwisely, yet he meant no harm. Ged worked also with the master summoner now, but that master was a stern man, aged and hardened by the deep and somber wizardry he taught. 
He dealt with no illusion, only true magic, the summoning of such energies as light and heat, and the force that draws the magnet, and those forces men perceive as weight, form, color, sound. Real powers drawn from the immense, fathomless energies of the universe which no man's spells or uses could exhaust or unbalance. The weather workers and sea masters calling upon wind and water were crafts already known to his pupils, but it was he who showed them why the true wizard uses such spells only at need, since to summon up such earthly forces is to change the earth of which they are a part. Rain on rope may be drought in, drought in Oskil, he said, and a calm in the east reach may be storm and ruin in the west, unless you know what you were about. I really like that Le, Le Guin used drought there, because yeah. I had to look up what that meant. I was like... I think it blew blew by me because I, I think the it sounds close enough to drought yeah. that I just heard it as drought. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's the old poetic way of saying drought. So yeah, cool. I think I think this is this is a really important slide and, and these are two very different kind of masters. One who is younger and therefore makes mistakes as well. This is a master that he is a master. He's the master changer, but he is young. And I think the book is saying with with age comes wisdom. And so he gives him books that he shouldn't and does things that he should have looped the Archmage in on. And I like what this is doing. This is kind of like setting us up. Like we, we've been building to this idea that Ged is going to make a big dumb decision here pretty soon. And we keep reinforcing it over and over again. We, over and over again, we have words about like, you, you shouldn't do something unless you know what the consequences are. You, like doing one thing somewhere could mess something up big somewhere else. And we see these lessons and we read them and we understand them, but there is no indication that our character does at all because right. the, the thing that I, that is chopped off from this conversation is right after this Ged is like asking the master summoner about death and calling back spirits and messing and summoning the dead. And this master is old enough and wise enough to where he says, no, don't do that. That'd be stupid. Why would you do something like that? That is the dumbest thing you could possibly do. And of course doesn't, doesn't listen. Yeah. Right. Like he's getting the metaphysical explanation for why someone like a giant, despite being really knowledgeable and strong would walk around in the rain. Like this is, this is explicitly the metaphysical reason why he does that. This is how magic works in this world. And he doesn't, he doesn't visibly make this connection. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't gain the wisdom that he needs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in discord, uh, a bird is saying, I do wish Lagun had, had taken more time to establish why Hoeg and Ojian loved Ged. It's such a protagonist thing to happen to someone. I mean, I, I guess See, this is this is the thing about this book is like because Sierra Grau falls it up with the book moved too quickly to really establish connections between the characters. I mean, I get like I I think back to like mythic poems and stuff, and like I don't think those stories are about connections between the characters, like their their morality plays, right? So I like, yeah, I guess I'm not bothered that we we t t don't take time to set up the the really set up the friendships and the connections between some of the characters we do when it's really important like i think we take time we there's several beats of uh ged's friendship that um that he had with uh and i just forgot his name what's is his it name red or something like that it starts v. with a v wow v something yeah, yeah. that guy um but yeah like the, why why is his master why does his master love him um because because he's his master. <laughs> why does Hoeg why does Hoeg love him? Because he came to him at a time where his thoughts were pure and remembering the trainings and the teachings of his wise master. And yeah. goodness begets goodness. Well, and you can also say Ojayan first came to him when he had almost sacrificed his life to try to save his people, so he recognized like the the spark of goodness in him and you know, and, and he's a, he's a dumb kid. So I think, I think that, that I don't think Le Guin is doing the Anakin Skywalker thing here where, where it's like, he has some good, he has some good in him, but there's also a great darkness. Like, 
No. It, yeah. It's more like that's just how people are. Right. Right. Like we, 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 we all have some good and, and some stuff that's lovable about us. And we all have some darkness in this and some stuff that's really potentially quite terrible if, if it's, you know, l let loose. And, um, the wise people in the story recognize that and they, they're not like, Oh, beware, beware of Ged for, you know, it, it's, it's more just like, Hey, um, you could use a little bit more wisdom, Ged, you know? Yeah. So yeah, pay, maybe, maybe pay attention. You're, you're absolutely right. That like he, he, there is no, there's no like prophesized greatness uh, or great evil in him. It's just that every, every man has a light side and a dark side. And when you are a more powerful person, your potential for darkness is equally more powerful. Um, it's, it's back to that equilibrium. Everything is in balance. So um, it's, it's not that he had, you're absolutely right. It's not that he has this great potential for bad. I like this point that a bird just made in discord where basically they point out that um, Sanderson's first law, which we cited before on, on different episodes of, I, I think this show mm -hmm. Is that, that an author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. And the point being here that actually in mythic stories like like this to a degree and much more so in something like Lord of the Rings, you don't understand how the magic works, but it's it's mythic. So you just kind of accept that it's conveying how powerful and awesome the magic user is. Right. Um. I would say that this is definitely not as far in that direction as Lord of the Rings, because like when he fights the dragons, you definitely understand how he does that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty well laid out actually. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Sergey says, uh, the moral messages of this chapter is about as subtle as a sack of bricks to the face. <laughs> Absolutely. But I think morality doesn't have to be subtle. Like I think in, in, a, in a moral like in a parable or a, a more or a morality myth, like the moral is very obvious because the point of the story is to teach the moral. So you have to make the moral obvious. You have to drive that home. You have to make people understand that because that is the purpose of the story. Yeah. And I mean, some people try to write stories that are really subtle and involve characters, you know, behaving in extremely evil ways, but justifying their actions to themselves. And, Everyone who reads those stories apparently thinks that it's actually about a re really heroic character who's just misunderstood. <laughs> see, so, uh, I see what you're doing there. So sometimes, you, sometimes it pays to be a little on the nose, nope, I guess. No comment from me. Uh, so then we move on to the main event. We're finally here, Matt. Uh, Jasper says mean things to Ged that all are basically like, "Hey, I'm older than you, and therefore know more about magic." And Ged's like, nah, uh And he's like, you're kind of a show-off brat sometimes, Ged. And he's like, nah, uh <laughs> so, to, so to prove that, um, Ged decides to bring someone back from the dead. You know, that thing he was told specifically yeah. not to ever do by, like, yeah. two different master mages. Yeah, like you do. Yeah. So here it is. And I this is a long one because I pulled out all of it and because it's really important. He did not even listen for Jasper's reply, if he made one. He no longer cared about Jasper. Now that they stood on Roke Knoll, hate and rage were gone, replaced by utter certainty. He need envy no one. He knew his power, this night, on this dark, enchanted ground, was greater than it had ever been, filling him till he trembled with the sense of strength barely kept in check. He knew now that Jasper was far beneath him, had been sent perhaps only to bring him here tonight, no rival but a mere servant of Ged's destiny. Under his feet he saw, he felt the hill roots going down and down into the dark, and over his head he saw the dry, far fires of the stars. Between, all things were his to order, to command. He stood at the very center of the world. Don't be afraid, he said, smiling. I'll call a woman, spirit. You need not fear a woman. Elfarin. I will call, the fair lady of the deed of Enlid. She died a thousand years ago. Her bones lie afar under the sea of Ea, and maybe there never was such woman. Two years and distances matter to the dead. Do the songs lie, Ged said with, some, with the same gentle mockery, and then sang, watch the air between my hands. 
He turned away from the others and stood still. In a great, slow gesture, he spread his out his arms, the gesture of welcome that opens an invocation. He began to speak. He had read the runes of the spell of summoning in Ojian's book two years and more ago, and never since had seen them. In darkness he had read them. Now in this darkness it was as if he read them again on the page open before him in the night. But now he understood what he read, speaking it aloud, word after word, and he saw the markings of how the spell must be woven with the sound of his voice and the motion of the body and hand. The other boys stood watching, not speaking, not moving unless they shivered a little, for the great spell was beginning to work. Ged's voice was soft still, but changed, with a deep singing in it, and the words he spoke were not known to them. He fell silent. Suddenly the wind rose, roaring in the grass. Ged dropped to his knees and called out aloud. Then he fell forward as if to embrace earth with his outstretched arms, and when he rose he held something dark in his strained hands and arms, something so heavy that he shook with the effort of getting to his feet. The hot wind whined in the black tossing grasses on the hill. If the stars shone now, none saw them. The words of the enchantment hissed and mumbled on Ged's lips, and then he cried out aloud and clearly. Elfarin, again he cried the name, Elfarin, and the third time, Elfarin. The shapeless mass of darkness he had lifted split apart. It sundered, and a pale spindle of light gleamed between his open arms, a faint oval reaching from the ground up to the height of his raised hands. In the oval of light, for a moment, there moved a form, a human shape, a tall woman looking back over her shoulder. Her face was beautiful and sorrowful and full of fear. Only for a moment did the spirit glimmer there. Then the sallow oval between Ged's arms grew bright. It widened and spread, a rent in the darkness of the earth and night, a ripping open of the fabric of the world. Through it blazed a terrible brightness. And through that bright, misshapen breach clamored something like a clot of black shadow, quick and hideous. And it leapt straight out at Ged's face. Well, Matt, he did it. Yeah. He did the thing. Did, did the spell committed a terrible sin against nature and the universe i love this writing though and that's why i knew this was long guys i'm sorry i just read like two pages but if we go back to the other page the, the like the the arrogance of it it's so like he knew that his power this night on this enchanted ground was greater than it had ever been he knew now that jasper was far beneath him only there only there to lead him to this point the entire world was his to command. The arrogance, the, the, the vanity, like, it's so stark. And, like, there is no doubt in anyone's mind that the thing he is doing is a terrible thing. The gentle mockery he talks with is so wonderful. Yeah. And, and I, I like the mythic writing here in particular, you know, because we've, we've essentially we've been building toward this moment for the whole book. Mm -hmm. Like you like you said, we've been getting these hints that he's he's not listening. He he has this arrogance and this lust for power and this desire to show off. We've been building toward this. We finally do it. It's it's as it's as powerful and terrifying as we as we could hope. And. And of course, it makes perfect sense that he does this thing, which is really sort of a, you know, crime against nature. Yeah. Like, just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summon the dead <laughs> to show off. Right. <laughs> and uh, gets immediately punished. And uh, and, and the, the detail here, like, he it succeeds. He calls Elfarin back from the dead, albeit temporarily. And mm -hmm. her face was beautiful and sorrowful and full of fear. Like, he's this, he's doing this terrible thing to the soul of this long dead person. He's scaring right. her, and he's yeah. just he's rending her apart. And just you're absolutely right. For no, there is no knowledge to this. There is no need to this. There is no point to any of this. It's just because he can do it. Yeah. And he is immediately punished, but also yeah. immediately saved once again because the great archmage of Roke appears and battles back the shadow and saves him and loses his life for it and this is when this is when ged ged has i think he's he's 16 by now right he's he's basically on the cusp of adulthood and 
now suddenly the things you do, the screw ups you do have consequences. You, you brought the shadow into the world and the only thing that stopped it from killing you outright or, or consuming you outright was the most powerful wizard in the world giving his life for you. Yeah. I, I, it, it seems like a good opportunity to talk about the idea of grace because Ged doesn't, if you're going to use the word deserve, I don't like the word deserve actually, but if you're going to use the word deserve, Ged doesn't deserve to be saved here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he certainly doesn't deserve to have someone sacrifice their life for him. I mean, you could argue that the archmage, like this is his responsibility. You could argue that I suppose, but yeah. Ged's made so many mistakes and he, and he's so like brashly run into this after being warned so many times that it's hard to say that he deserves anything other than to be eaten by a shadow. <laughs> um, but, but yet at, at each of these turns at each of these opportunities, he is, he is saved out of pure, pure grace. And just like, you know, if you define grace as like undeserved forgiveness, undeserved salvation. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing is, the story has already told us from the very beginning that he becomes this great, powerful, deserving Gandalf wizard. <laughs> um, and, and that's the thing is uh, there's a lot of real people in the real world. Y you or I, maybe some of them who weren't were, we, 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 like when we were 13, we probably did stupid things that, could have could have gotten us killed right like the, the median person has probably done stupid things that could have gotten them killed yeah that doesn't have any bearing on whether when they're 60 years old and they've like saved an orphanage or something like 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 of course people deserve i, I don't know i'm not being terribly coherent here but like like this idea that people don't deserve to be saved, I think, is a terrible notion, actually. Like, like everything yeah. I was just saying, I was saying tongue-in-cheek. Like, of course everyone deserves to be saved, right? Yeah. I, I, don't, I, I, don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm fully making sense here, but... No, I agree, because, yeah. Okay. And, I mean, you can make the argument that the reason it's done is because the thing will consume his body and then be a super powerful wizard zombie thing, but that's, that, that is not why the Archmage saves him there. The Archmage saves him because that's what you do. When someone's yeah. in need, you you help them. Yeah, especially like a stupid kid. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. especially a child that still has not quite learned their lesson. Yeah. Okay. So this next, next. slide is him talking to the new archmage that was pro chosen. He basically, get is d near dead for like a, almost a year, right? Like he's and then he's like he's recovering and then he's like really slow and he's downtrodden and like defeated he's not he's lost all his power and uh he's he's trying to figure out what to do next yeah and he has this badly scarred face for the rest of his life as far as we know yeah yeah um and the archmage says uh what do you want to stay to learn to undo the evil nimmerle himself could not do that no, I would not let you go from Roke. Nothing protects you but the power of the masters here and the defenses laid upon this island that keep the creatures of evil away. If you left now, the thing you loosed would find you at once and enter into you and possess you. You would be no man, but a gebeth, a puppet, doing the will of that evil shadow which you raised up into the sunlight. You must stay here until you gain strength and wisdom enough to defend yourself from it, if ever you do. Even now it waits for you. Assuredly it waits for you. Have you seen it since that night? In dreams, Lord. After a while, Ged went on, speaking with pain and shame. Lord Gresher, I do not know what it was, the thing that came out of the spell and cleaved to me. Nor do I know. It has no name. You have great power inborn in you, and you use that power wrongly to work a spell over which you had no control, not knowing how the spell affects the balance of light and dark, life and death, good and evil. And you were moved to do this by pride and by hate. Is it any wonder the result was ruin? You summoned a spirit from the dead, and with it came one of the powers of unlife. Uncalled it came from a place where there are no names. Evil, it will, it, it will to work evil through you. The power you had to call it gives it power over you. You are connected. It is the shadow of your arrogance, the shadow of your ignorance, the shadow you cast. Has a shadow a name? Yes. Yes, yes it does. It's, it's Ken. 
Yes, but it's your shadow. But I, I, but and you and I talked about this earlier today that the archmage basically tells him exactly how to defeat the shadow. Right? He says, yeah. "This is your shadow. This is the shadow of your misdeeds. A shadow of your arrogance. The shadow of your ignorance. This is the shadow you cast." What is the name of that shadow? Well, it's yours. And but he but he's not going to just come out and say, "Hey, call the call the shadow by your name," because that's yeah. then you don't learn. You did the, the you don't learn anything. Um, right. But he has given him the tools he needs to understand. Yeah, he's given. Yeah, he he, he can process this and turn it into wisdom. I mean, I, I like I like in particular that he says. Um, now I can't find what he, what he said exactly, but it was like you need you need the power and the wisdom to fight it. Yeah. And he doesn't just say like, oh, you need to become stronger so you can fight it. No, certainly not. I mean, that's if anything, using his power against the shadow proves to be completely counterproductive. Yeah. Um, well, he has to he has to gain the wisdom of understanding what it is. Right. Right. I mean, he says here he wants to undo the evil, mm -hmm. and. The, the response is that the the archmage that died could not even undo it the most powerful wizard in the world could not undo the evil you cannot undo this evil you cannot unpush a button you cannot undo your choices um what you can do is learn to live with them and that's that's a big part of so yeah i mean like you read here the hints as as to what the lessons he needs to learn are all here and they're not exactly subtle it's just he's a kid still like even after all this even he is still has learning to do yeah sergey in the chat points out or, or or gives the opinion that the book is really really liberal with the use of the word evil and that's interesting and i don't i don't think i can agree or disagree because i don't remember where and when the book uses the word I, I did get the the sense reading it that the book at least has like its own internally consistent metaphysics where Le Guin has a clear idea of what evil is in this world. Um, and it may not be the same thing that maps on to what we think of as evil, but yeah. I may be, I may be, I mean, that may be a fair sort of accusation. I'm, I'm not, I'd have to read the book again, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I, I again fall back on the, 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 which it might be a crush, but, in mythic storytelling like myth doesn't deal with gray it doesn't deal with um complex morality it doesn't deal with these things it's not it's, it's not the, the type of story it's telling um sauron was not a misunderstood um guy just trying to make the world a better place sauron yeah. was evil and, yeah and he the, was evil for evil's sake yeah and that, i mean that that's that like that is that is kind of how Lord of the Rings defines evil, right? Bad for the sake of being bad, and mm -hmm. and I think I think that's what evil in in this story is. Um, so e e stories like this use words like good and evil as if they are knowable, defined black and white constructs. Um, they're they're obviously not, but within the the construct of the world, they are. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, now that you mention the Tolkien thing, I believe the Tolkien professor, uh, whose podcast we've recommended, basically interprets Tolkien's definition of evil as being a will to exert power over the world. Yeah. And, and in, 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 in opposition with living in harmony with the world. So like the elves live in harmony, Sauron and, and Morgoth want to exert their will onto the world. Um, and then men are actually kind of torn between the two extremes. Um, and I think there's actually a lot of similarity in this story because e evil in this story does seem to be this this will to blindly exert your will on the world yeah. and, and not understand the harmony of it. I mean, it's exactly the same thing, really. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's cool. And Sierra Grau points out that Tolkien is very much against metaphysically evil things. I mean, that's that's true. Like, Sauron was corrupted by morgoth right like i don't, I don't want to get into it <laughs> i want to get into a whole like or created by morgoth rather i don't remember it I'm, yeah he, he he was he was corrupted they were all original kind of angels together yeah um and and morgoth was basically 
the original guy who wanted to just wanted... have the song include his way of doing right. things that was different from 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 the way you know God wanted it to be and and out of and and every time he tried to go out of harmony, God was just like, actually, I meant for you to do that, and um, which <laughs> right. became, which was very frustrating to him that yeah. he was being trolled by God. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the idea of evil, evil as defined as your desire to exert your own will over the world is, I think, the best way to, to define it. And that is that is basically what evil in Lord of the Rings is, and I think that's what evil in, in Earthsea is as well. Yeah. Not that I necessarily agree that that's a good definition of evil, but that, that is how these stories tend to do it. Right. Okay. Next. Um, so... Next slide. This is when he Ged. says goodbye to his buddy, right? Yeah, he says goodbye to his buddy. Um, and we've been told of the power of true names throughout the book before this moment, but I like how this really cements that power for us in an emotional way. It helps us define how important these two are to each other, which also ends up mattering in the end. Yeah. Sparrowhawk. If, you ever, if you ever your way lies east, come to me. And if ever you need me, send for me. Call on me by my name, Estariel. At that, Ged lifted his scarred face, meeting his friend's eyes. Estariel, he said. My name is Ged. Then quietly they bade each other farewell, and Vetch turned and went down the stone hallway and left Roke. Ged stood still a while, like one who has received great news, and must enlarge his spirit to receive it. It was a great gift that Vetch had given him, the knowledge of his true name. No one knows a man's true name but himself and his neighbor. He may choose at length to tell it to a brother, or his wife, or his friend. Yet even those few will never use it where, there, where any third person may hear it. In front of the other people, they will, like all other people, call him by his use name, his nickname, such a name as Sparrowhawk, and Vetch, and Ogeon, which means fire cone. If plain men hid their true name from all but the few they loved and trust utterly, so much more so much more must wizardly men being more dangerous and more endangered who knows a man's name holds that man's life in his keeping thus to ged who had lost faith in himself vetch had given the gift only a friend can give the proof of unshaken unshakable trust so yeah as you said this is reinforcing the, the power of names of naming things and reinforcing the friendship between these two a friendship that will extend out to the end of the book and proving once again that that ged's strongest thing is the the people he surrounds himself with and who continue to give him things right when he needs it yeah and speaking of, of this theme of grace um this this guy is he has this infinite capacity for just offering a friendship yeah and and it's not like it's not like Ged ever did anything nice for him. It's just he he's just big hearted and and Ged ev eventually you know reciprocates and and they become good friends and and it's a mutual friendship. But you kind of get the sense that if it had been up to Ged, he wouldn't have had any any real true friends like this. He's he's relying on this grace from the universe and he kind of learns how valuable it is. Yeah, and and. Vetch does this at great risk to himself because yeah. Ged has this thing chasing him that could consume him and then become this all powerful thing that now knows this wizard's name that could command him in any way he wanted to. And this is, this is, this is a huge, huge, huge gesture. And I like that we set up and we take the time to, to define how huge of a gesture this is. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. All right, um, next slide. So we, we've so, jumped ahead a little bit here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, at this point in time, Ged has finished his studies at Roke and he's heading off on his first assignment to protect a tiny fishing town from some dragons. A friendly boatmaker's son gets deathly ill and Ged momentarily travels to the land of the dead in, in an attempt to save him. There he finds the shadow waiting for him. Hoeg saves him by licking his face and bringing him back from the dead. Um, from the land of the dead, but Ged decides he must leave immediately. First, he's got to go deal with the pesky dragon problem that he's there for, though. First, he murders some baby dragons and then has a chat with the ancient dragon. So um, so here we have Ged has, has a chat with this dragon uh, who tries to convince it that, it that he can help 
Ged, and Ged needs to find the name of the shadow, and the dragon says he knows the name of the shadow. Um, Ged doesn't uh, doesn't listen. Well, let, let's see. Let's see. You are a very young wizard, the dragon said. I did not know men came so young into their power. He spoke as Ged did in the old speech, for that is the tongue of dragons still. Although the, the use of the old speech binds a man to truth, this is not so with dragons. It is their own language, and they can lie in it, twisting the true words to false ends, catching the unwary hearer in a maze of mirror words, each of which reflects the truth and none of which leads anywhere. So Ged had been warned often, and when the dragon spoke, he listened with an untrustful ear, all his doubts ready. But the words seemed plain and clear. Is it to ask my help that you have come here, little wizard? No, dragon. Yet I could help you. You will need help soon against that which hunts you in the dark. Ged stood dumb. What is it that hunts you? Name it to me. If I could name it, Ged stopped himself. Yellow smoke curled above the dragon's long head. From the nostrils there were two round pits of fire. If you could name it, you could master it, maybe, little wizard. Maybe I could tell you its name when I see it close by. And it will come close if you wait about my isle. It will come wherever you come. If you did not want it to come close to you, you must run and run and keep running from it. And yet it will follow you. Would you like to know its name? But he says no. Yeah. It's He's finally learning some restraint, yeah, so perhaps. I'm curious. Do you think the dragon would have told him the name of the shadow? Do you think the dragon would have said, it's your name, dummy? Do you think if he um, struck that bargain, he would have actually gotten what he needed out of it? I kind of doubt it. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of doubt it, too. Like... Like it, 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 it seems like it probably would have been a trick of some kind right. or another. I mean, you know? we had a whole paragraph where we, we described their talking as mirror speech. So yeah, right. It's literally think, giving him exactly what he wants. I think narratively, this is meant to be Ged like recognizing, you know, actual wisdom for the first time. Yeah, and being like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not take the marshmallow. I'm gonna hold out, and. uh yeah. But the dragon also tells him you got to run and run and keep running, which is the wrong thing to do. So uh, on on the one hand, he he's wise enough to know that the dragon is not something he can trust. On the other hand, he also does what the dragon says cuz he sets off immediately from here and decides, "I'm just going to run forever." Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think I think it is it is this great it's this great middle ground between showing that he has learned something but also showing that he is not learned everything yet he is not yet right. wise yeah which we will see in this next interaction okay um when a, a strange man comes up to him and gives him the exact thing that he needs which is something that is not suspicious at all i do not know you said the man in gray yet i think perhaps we did not meet by chance i heard a tale once of a young man a scarred man who won through darkness to great domination even to kingship. I do not know if that is your tale, but I will tell you this. Go to the court of Terranon. If you need a sword to fight shadows with, a staff of you would would not serve your need. Hope and mistrust struggled in Ged's mind as he listened. A wizardly man soon learns that few indeed of his meetings are chance ones, be they for good or for ill. In what land is the court of Terranon? In Oskil. At the sound of, of that name, Ged saw for a moment by a trick of memory a black raven on green grass who looked up at him sidelong with an eye like polished stone and spoke, but the words were forgotten. That land has something of a dark name, Ged said, looking ever at the man in gray, trying to judge what kind of man he was. There was a manner about him that hinted of the sorcerer, even of the wizard, and yet, boldly as he spoke to Ged, there was a queer beaten look about him, a look almost of a sick man, or a prisoner, or a slave. You are from Roke, he answered. The wizards of Roke give a dark name to the wizardries other than their own. So here's this guy that he immediately doesn't trust, 
but listens to anyway. Yeah. So uh, th- there was one thing, the 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 trick of memory, a, a black raven on green ga- gla- grass who looked up at him sidelong with an eye like polished stone. Um, what is is that from when he was on Roke? I, I remember an Oskillian raven appearing there at one point. The only the only raven that I remember was the Archmage's familiar, right? Wasn't that a raven? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It was. So like I I, I honestly I didn't. Th- dwell too long on this but when i was reading it i remember thinking like is the is the archmage's like spirit trying to communicate with him here but i don't this doesn't really go anywhere so i mean it's just he he's getting like red flags all over the place um yeah like this yeah <laughs> but but i i do love that the way this guy is telling is like he's still feeding into ged's lust for power um i heard a tale once of a young man a scarred man who won through darkness to great domination even to kingship it's like oh i heard this tale of this this man that's going to become so powerful and become king all he has to do is come get the sword and he'll solve his problem and everything will be great and this guy kind of looks like a sorcerer but also could be a slave maybe yeah Yeah, better better listen Better yeah, list. and also implying that he needs a sword to fight shadows with, right. which is, it's like, again, like you just said, appeals to this narrative of like, oh yeah, you're going to be the strong warrior, you're going to fight this thing, and that's not how that's not at all how it ends up being, of course. And and I and I I would be lying if I didn't say at this moment, oh, so here's where he becomes the warrior because this does seem very fantasy tropish, right? It's like he's going to get the he's going to find the the one sword that can defeat the shadow. Um so this even worked on me to a point where I was like, is this where the story's going now? I can, I can see he's get the sword and then he defeats the the shadow and then becomes the great mage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, it worked on me for a little bit here, except accepting all these little hints at a sick man or a prisoner or a slave right yeah i mean there's i think part of me was thinking at this part of like the wizards of rope give a dark name to the wizardries other than their own i was thinking like okay well maybe he does need to go delve into some of these darker right you know he he needs to learn some about how the dark side of things works in order to defeat it but um no not really yeah yeah so next, um, the shadow shows up. Yeah. And he's a, warns him. Yeah. Yeah. This is when he's walking Hoig through the tundra with the guy he met on the boat that had a scary changing face that he noticed and then just kind of ignored. Yeah. Right. That was really creepy. <laughs> the Otak stirred in his pocket and a little vague fear also woke and stirred in his mind. He forced himself to speak. Darkness comes, and snow. How far, Skior? After a pause, the other answered without turning. Not far. But his voice sounded not like a man's voice, but like a beast, hoarse and lipless, that tries to speak. Ged stopped. All around stretched empty hills in the late dusk light. Sparse snow whirled, a little falling. Skior, he said, and the other halted and turned. But there was no face under that peaked hood. Before Ged could speak spell or summon power, the Gebeth spoke, saying in its hoarse voice, Ged. Then the young man could work no transformation, but was locked in his true being and must face the Gebeth thus defenseless. Nor could he summon any help in this alien land where nothing and no one was known to him and would come to his call. He stood alone with nothing between him and his enemy but the staff of Yewood in his right hand. He ran, and the Gebeth followed pace behind him, unable to outrun him, yet never dropping behind. Ged never looked back. He ran, he ran, through that vast dusk land where there was no hiding place. Once the Gebeth and its hoarse whistling voice called him again by name, but though it had taken his wizard's power thus, it had no power over his body's strength and could not make him stop. He ran. Hi, Shadow. It's a shadow, dude. Yeah. That's why I can't catch you. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Um, but once again, we get Hoeg warning him of, of impending yeah. danger. He stirs in his pocket, which makes him stir in his mind. Um, and, and part of me wonders what would have happened if, if he didn't have Hoeg here. Would he have just been led somewhere and gotten so tired that the shadow would have just enveloped him? I, we don't know. But 
either way, he's he confronts the shadow for the first time. Um, he tries to fight it. He tries to hit it with his staff, and it burns him. The staff lights yeah. on fire and burns his arm. Um, he just completely fails in every imaginable way to fight the shadow. Yep. And then so he runs to the court of Terranon, which is not at all a scary place. No, this is this is not one of the most disturbing things that I've read recently. If this was strange, it was only part of the strangeness of this place and of his presence in it. Ged's mind never seemed quite clear. He could not see things plainly. He had come to this tower keep by chance, and yet the chance was all design. Or he had come by design, and yet all the design had merely chanced to come about. He had set out northward, a stranger in Ormi, had told him to seek help here. An Oskillian ship had been waiting for him. Score had guided him. How much of this was the work of the shadow that haunted him? Or was none of it? Had he and his hunter both been drawn here by some other power? He followed that lure and the shadow following him, and seizing on Score for its weapon when that moment came. That must be it. For certainly the shadow was as Seret had said, barred from the court of the Terranon. Yet he felt no sign or threat of its lurking presence since he wakened in the tower. But what, then, had brought him here? For this was no place one came to by chance. Even in the dullness of his thoughts he began to see that. No other stranger came to these gates. The tower stood aloof and remote. Its back turned on the way to Nesham that was the nearest town. No man came to the keep. None left it. Its windows locked down on desolation. Cool place. It's yeah. definitely not evil. Yeah, the, the this whole sequence... I mean, this book is divided into a few different parts, yeah. and all the parts I think are really cool and unique and and evocative. But the creepy the creepy tower part is one of the more like fairy tale ish. Yeah. Um, and and it's very effective and uh, unsettling. Yeah, I like um, I like this word usage a lot. Um, he had come to this tower keep by chance, and yet the chance was all design. Or he had come by design, and that all the design had merely chanced to come about. That turn of phrase, I really, really like. Yeah, yeah me too. Um, so the next plot point is the lady of the court of Terranon tempts Ged with a magical stone locked away in the vault. And then here we have Ged finally learning something. Yay. He, he rejects the power of Terranon, finally learning that all things have a price. Um I, I like the imagery of only shadow can defeat shadow, which Ged rejects by channeling the idea of equilibrium um, and, and actually kind of throwing that back at someone for the first time in the book. Yeah, yeah. And you came to Oskil, and on the moors you tried to fight a shadow with your wooden staff, and almost we could not save you. For that thing that follows you is more cunning than we deemed and had taken much strength from you already. Only shadow can fight shadow. Only darkness can defeat the dark. Listen, Sparrowhawk, what, you, what do you need, then, to, fe to defeat the shadow, which waits for you outside these walls? I need what I cannot know, its name. The Terranon, it knows all births and deaths and beings before and after death, the unborn and the, and the undying, the bright world and the dark one, will tell you that name. And the price? There is no price. I tell you it will obey you, serve you as your slave. Shaken and tormented, he did not answer. He held his hand now. She held his hand now in both of hers, looking into his face. The sun had fallen in, into the mists that dulled the horizon, and the air, too, had grown dull. But, there, but her face grew bright with praise and triumph as she watched him and saw his will shaken within him. Softly, she whispered, You will be mightier than all men, a king among men. You will rule, and I will rule with you. Suddenly, Ged stood up and one step forward took him where he could see, just around the curve of the long room's wall, beside the door, the lord of the Terranon, who stood listening and smiling a little. Ged's eyes cleared, and his mind. He looked down at Seret. It is the light that defeats the dark, he said, stammering. Light. He had almost yielded, but not quite. He had not consented. It is very hard for evil to take hold of the unconsenting soul. So I, I love this so much. Um, yeah. and, and like like you said, this is the first time in the book we've seen him employ the lessons that he's learned. Um, this is the first time he a he's asked for the price of a power. He's never done that before. He's never asked what the price of a certain power is. And he's he's 
the, the idea of equilibrium, the idea of shadow, only shadow can fight shadow. Only darkness can defeat the dark, which we know from his teaching is, is not true. We know that dark and light are in equilibrium. We know the creation of Aya says so, light and dark, sound and silence. They are in equilibrium. Shadow cannot defeat shadow. And yeah. he realizes that finally, finally, um, and makes the right choice. Yep. It is very hard for evil to take hold of the unconsenting soul. Another, another little hint toward how to deal with a shadow. Yeah. And I thought that was a fantastic line too, because like it's b both the metaphysics of how the world, or how the story world works and like true human wisdom coincide here, I think, because like it, it, that's true. Like you can't, you can't become evil without consenting to that evil yeah. on some level. Like, like, you know, the, the, uh, I was just following orders. Defense is not a defense because you have, cons in order to get to that point, you've consented to the evil. Yeah. And, and that's, that's why you did the evil. You can't trip and fall into evil. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Ged then escapes from the court of Terranon leaving Serret behind to presumably get killed, right? Like she turns into right. a bird and tries to fly away and gets eaten by shadow birds or something. Yeah. Uh, like he finds her like feathers later. Yeah. yeah I think she's, she's super dead. Yeah. Um, he also loses Hoeg in the process. He finds Hoeg's poor, broken, dead corpse. Um, yeah. uh, this is great because Ged has, has realized his mistakes, but is still clearly required to pay for them. And, and losing Hoeg is one of, the prices of his mistakes. Um, he turns into a hawk and flies away from the north. He ends up back with Ojayan, but he's been a hawk for too long and has forgotten how to be a man. And once again, the wise wizard saves him. That's the third time, by the way. That's number three. Um, he saves him and then finally gives him the advice that he is ready to listen to. Sergei says, why can't Shadow defeat Shadow? If two shadows fight, shouldn't one of them win? No. It would just make more shadow. That's the it, that's, that's the whole thing about equilibrium. Like, yeah, n no more than two lights can shine together and suddenly create more darkness. I mean, it's it's, it's a metaphor. Yeah, light, right? light doesn't yeah. light doesn't cancel out light. Darkness doesn't cancel out darkness. It just makes more darkness. There is no safe place, Ojayan said gently. Do not transform yourself again, Ged. The shadow seeks to destroy your true being. Being, It nearly did so, driving you into Hawk's being. No. Where you should go, I do not know. Yet I have an idea of what you should do. It is a hard thing to say to you. Ged's silence demanded truth, and Ojayan said at last, You must turn around. Turn around? If you go ahead, if you keep running, wherever you run, you will meet danger and evil, for it drives you. It chooses the way you go. You must choose. You must seek what seeks you. You must hunt the hunter. Ged said nothing. At the spring of the river are, I named you, the mage said, a stream that falls from the mountain to the sea. A man would know the end he goes to, but he cannot know if he does not turn and return to his beginning and hold the beginning in his being. If he would not be a stick whirled and whelmed in the stream, he must be the stream itself, all of it, from its spring to its sinking in the sea. You returned to Gaunt. You returned to me, Ged. Now turn clear round and seek the very source and that which lies before the source. There lies your hope of strength. There, master, Ged said with terror in his voice. Where? O giant did not answer. If I turn, Ged said after some time has gone by, if as you say I hunt the hunter, I think the hunt will not be long. All its desire is to meet me face to face, and twice it has done so, and twice defeated me. Third time is the charm, said Ojayan. Um, this is great. This is all great. Yeah. I'd love here's here's what i what i picked out when i was pulling this and as i was typing this when i realized this the truth of what ojayan has to say is not revealed to ged until he is silent 
Ged's silence demanded truth. Silence brings about the word. It's something we were told from the very beginning of this book, and Ged is silent throughout this, and only through the silence can the truth of the words Ojayan has to say be revealed to him. And so it is through that silence, it is through shutting up and listening that what he needs to do is revealed to him. Yeah. And I right. love it so much. I like that they both have turns of silence here. Like, yeah. Like Ged continues being silent at first. And then at the end, Ged asks, you know, where, and, and then Ojayan doesn't answer. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and it says, you know, some time passes and Ged kind of processes it and then moves on. And, and like, it's, it's, I, I like it cause you know, Ojayan has always had this thing where he'll, he'll like walk half a mile between saying sentences. Right. Um, and it's like Ged has actually absorbed and understood the value of thinking uh, before speaking. Yep, yep. And it is, it is. I think you're absolutely right that the, the beats of their conversations seem to match each other now. The rhythm of the talking, the silence between the phrases is now matching. And that does show that he has learned. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it's a conversation between two wizards rather than between a, a wizard and a stupid kid. Yeah. And then I love um, that Ojayan is just kind of kind of plucky at the end. Third time is the charm, which is yeah. I guess almost anachronistic. Like I don't I would that expression exist <laughs> in this world? I don't know. Yeah, sure. It's it's a powerful wizarding enchantment. I guess you're right. I guess yeah. you're right. So next bit we have Ged finally meets the shadow and hunted becomes hunter. So um he sees he's on a boat right now. Mm-hmm. Then, far off in the rain over the water, he saw the shadow coming. It had done with the body of the Asgillian uh, oarsman named Skior, and not as Gebeth did it follow him through the winds and over the sea, nor did it wear the beast shape in which, it had, in which, it had, in which he had seen it on the Roke Knoll and in his dreams. Yet it had a shape now, even in the daylight. In its pursuit of Ged and in its struggle with him on the moors, it had drawn power from him sucking it into itself and it may be that his summoning of it aloud in the light of day had given it or forced upon it some form and semblance certainly it had now some likeness to a man though being shadow it cast no shadow so it came over the sea out of the jaws of any inlad toward gaunt a dim ill-made thing pacing uneasy on the waves peering down wind as it came and the cold rain blew through it because it was half blinded by the day and because he had called it, Ged saw it before it saw him. He knew it as it knew him among all beings, all shadows. In the terrible solitude of the winter sea, Ged stood and saw the thing he feared. The wind seemed to blow it farther from the boat and the waves ran under it, bewildering his eye. And ever and again, it seemed closer to him. He could not tell if it moved or not. It had seen him now, though there was nothing in his mind but horror and fear of its tough, uh, the cold black pain that drained his life away, yet he waited unmoving. Then all at once, speaking aloud, he called the mage wind strong and sudden into his white sail, and his boat leapt across the gray waves straight at the lowering that hung upon the wind. In utter silence, the shadow and wavering turned and fled. And for the first time, he did, he did something right. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's cool. It's a cool moment because because really you're like I, I mean I was like you you kind of his fear kind of goes into you like you're you're as afraid of this thing as him, and when a giant's like ah oh, you got to go after it you're like I don't know man this yeah. thing's pretty dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen what this thing can do, a giant? Yeah. Um, but of course, you know, it's a metaphor. It's not. It, it's the kind of thing where, you know, as a shadow, if you run from a shadow, it follows you. If you chase a shadow, it flees you, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. You cannot yeah. ever catch your shadow. Your shadow cannot ever catch you. Yeah. All right. So now, now the, the hunt is on. Now the sea quest of Ged's was a strange matter. For as he well knew, he was a hunter who knew neither what the thing was that he hunted, nor where in all of Earthsea it might be. He must hunt it by guess, by hunch, by luck, even as it had hunted him. Each was blind to the other's being. Ged as baffled by impalpable shadows as the shadow was baffled by daylight and by solid things. One certainty only Ged had, 
that he was indeed the hunter now, and not the hunted, for the shadow having tricked him onto the rocks might have led, had him at his mercy all the while he lay half dead on the shore and blundered in the darkness in the stormy dunes, but it had not waited for that chance. It had tricked him and fled away at once, not daring now to face him. In this he saw that Ojayan had been right. The shadow could not draw on his power so long as he was turned against it. So he must keep against it, keep after it, though its track was cold across these wild, wide seas, and he had nothing at all to guide him but the luck of the world's wind blowing southward, and a dim guess or notion in his mind that south or east was the right way to follow. So I don't have much to say about this other than I just love how this stuff is described so much. Like, I just, I love reading this text so much. Yeah, it gives you all the right feelings. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. There's not much so, specifically to say. It's just like, you're like, yeah. yeah. So he must keep against it, keep after it, though its track was cold across these wide seas, and he had nothing at all to guide him but the luck of the world's wind blowing southward and a vague notion that that mm -hmm. south or east. Like, it's just so beautiful. I love it so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then next, he moves on. He keeps chasing it. He gets off that little spit of rock, uh, and, and he, he catches the shadow at last. But, well, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. All terror was gone. All joy was gone. It was a chase no longer. He was neither hunted nor hunter now. For the third time, they had met and touched. He had of his own will turned to the shadow, seeking to hold it with living hands. He had not held it but he had forged between them a bond, a link that had no breaking point. There was no need to hunt the thing down to track it, nor would its flight avail it. Neither could escape. When they had come to the time and place for their last meeting, they would meet. But until that time, and elsewhere than that place, there would never be any rest or peace for Ged, day or night, on earth or sea. He knew now, and the, and the knowledge was hard, that his task had never been to undo what he had done, but to finish what he had begun. That is great. Um, yeah. and, and that's like, you can divide the second half of this book, basically everything after he leaves Roke to hunted hunter, and then kind of resigned to your fate. The third, the third, he, he's not really hunting anymore. He's just going to where he knows this is going to end. And I, his task had never been to undo what he had done, but to finish what he begun. I love the sentiment of that so much because that that echoes his his conversation with the archmage when he was at Roke. That I I want to learn how to undo this, to undo the shadow, to undo evil. Mm -hmm. And his realization here is is that's that's not that's not what he's going to do. He has to finish what he has begun, almost as if he needs to let this thing come into him, almost as yeah. if. Right, and it's not clear how much he understands what needs to happen, but no, not just he, yet. Yeah, but he knows that he can't put it off for much longer. Yeah. And then it's time for our old buddy to come back, because Ged is in the south, the East Reach, and he's sad and lonely. And who should show up when he's sad and lonely? But the same guy who showed up last time, he was sad and lonely. Ged knew that he should spend only one night in Ismay. There was no welcome for him there, or anywhere. He must go where he was bound. But he was sick of the cold, empty sea and the silence where no voice spoke to him. He told himself he would spend one day in Ismay, and on the morrow go. So he slept late. When he woke, a light snow was falling, and he idled about the lanes and byways of the town to watch the busy people busy at their doings. He watched children bundled in fur capes playing at snow castles and building snowmen. He heard gossip chatting across the streets from open doors, and he watched the bronze smith at work with the little red, little lad red-faced and sweating to pump the long bellow sleeves at the smelting pit. Through windows lit with dim ruddy gold from within, as the short day darkened, he saw women at their looms turning a moment to speak or smile to child or husband there in the warmth within the house. Ged saw all these things from outside and apart, alone. And his heart was very heavy in him, though he would not admit it to himself that he was sad. As night fell, he still lingered in the streets, reluctant to go back to the inn. He heard a man and girl talking together merrily as they came down the street past him, towards the town square, and all at once he turned, for he knew the man's voice. 
He followed and caught up with the pair, coming up beside them in the late twilight, lit only by distant lantern gleams. The girl stepped back, but the man stared at him and then flung up the staff he carried, holding it between them as a barrier to ward off threat or act of evil. And that was somewhat more than Ged could bear. His voice shook a little as he said, I thought you would know me, Vetch. Even then, Vetch hesitated a moment. I do know you, he said, and he lowered the staff and took Ged's hand and hugged him round the shoulders. I do know you. It's good old Vetch just coming in to be great. And the thing the thing that I love about this and this entire section of the book as he's on Ismay is, is Ged getting a glimpse into what normal life looks like what a life that he has never had looks like um we we specifically point out the bronze smith which was his father we point out children playing and having fun which is something we never really saw him do because he he always had this lust for power um and and this is this is a normal life that he will never he has never and nor ever will have yeah um and i think that on some level, he thought that becoming a, a wizard was going to make him happy, and far from it. It's sort of made him this miserable, hunted creature. Um, yeah. And and le- like you said, he, he's he's seeing he's basically seeing the life he left behind, the life he, the life he could have had. Yeah. And and he's quite melancholy about it because he has no he has no human connections, right? And and then and then you know just by chance, right? Or or by grace, perhaps he he happens upon like his one best friend in the world who's here, um, and their Vetch is frightened of him at first, but that's because there's like a ghoul that looks like him stalking <laughs> yeah, around, of yeah. course. Yeah, and of course he recognizes him and and hooray. Yeah, I like what you said about about the life he gave up because we're gonna see um, in the in this next slide, Ged meets how do you pronounce it, Mur. Uh, yeah, um, I think Murr, that sounds right. Yeah, Ged meets Murr, which is, uh, Vetch's brother, um, and, oh, go ahead and read the slide and then we'll talk about this. Yeah. Having affairs he must see to before he left Ifish, Vetch went off to other villages of the island with the lad who served him as Prentice Sorcerer. Ged stayed with Yarrow and her brother, called Murr, who was between her and Vetch in age. He seemed not much more than a boy for there was no gift or scourge of mage power in him, and he had never been anywhere but Ifish, Talk, and Holp, and his life was easy and untroubled. Ged watched him with wonder and some envy, and exactly so he watched Ged. To each it seemed very queer that the other, so different, yet was his own age, nineteen years. Ged marveled how one who had lived nineteen years could be so carefree. Admiring Murr's comely, cheerful face, he felt himself to be all lank and harsh, never guessing that Murr envied him even the scars that scored his face and thought them the track of a dragon's claws and the very rune and sign of a hero so i love i love the comparison between ged and mer so much um Mm -hmm. uh, mer is a bird i think it's a seabird it's a name for a seabird and ged is a a sparrow hawk so like these these are not subtle comparisons i mean these two people are mer is basically what ged could have been had he not pursued this power um, this is this is what life as a normal hum- human and I think it goes to show that no matter what's I mean it's the whole grass is always greener lesson right it's like no matter what side of this whole thing you're on you will always be looking at the other as, as envious and therefore like looking longingly at someone else's life is basically a waste of time yeah yeah it's, it's a beautiful expression of, of that idea yeah, yeah. And it, it, this is one of the things where I'm like yeah it probably would have been good to read this when I was younger just because Sometimes it's nice to have even a cliche like grass is always green on the, on the other side. It's nice to have the cliche like repackaged into something fresh and actually touching to, to, to you, you know, because like the reason it's a cliche is that it's true. And if you just kind of go on with your life and don't really absorb it, then that's a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And that's that's Murr's point here. And we're getting we're getting near the end. They've set out, they've left the island, and they're going to the end, and suddenly our poor Ged gets a little a little wistful. I wish I could have seen all the cities of the archipelago. Pelago, why do I keep saying that wrong? 
Ged had said as he held the sail rope, watching the wide gray wastes before them. Havnor at the world's heart, and Ea where the myths were born, and Shelith of the fountains on way, all the cities and the great lands and the small lands, the strange lands of the outer reaches, them too, to sail right down the dragon's run away in the west, or to sail north into the ice flows, clear to Hogan land. Some say that is a land greater than all the archipelago. And others say it is merely reefs and rocks with ice between. No one knows. I must go where I am bound to go and turn my back on the bright shores. I was in too much haste, and now I have no time left. I traded all the sunlight and the cities and the distant lands for a handful of power, for a shadow, for the dark. So as the mage born will. Ged made his fear and regret into a song, a brief lament half sung that was not for himself alone, and his friend replying spoke the hero's words from the deed of Eric Akbeth. Oh, may I see the earth's bright hearth once more, the white towers of Havnor. So here he is saying basically what everyone says on the cusp of adulthood. Being a kid is awesome. And I should not have tried to rush through it as soon as possible. I was in too much haste, and now I have no time left. There was so much I wanted to do, and my life is now coming to an end. And I didn't get to do it. Yes. Interesting that we all see we all see encroaching adulthood as like a monstrous shadow that's going to destroy us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a but kid, it really... is. Well, like, yeah. I mean, it's kind of one of the things you're inundated throughout your entire life about how, like, like they say high school is the time of your life and then college is the time of your life and you're like, you're not giving me a lot to look forward to when this stuff yeah. comes to an end. Right. Um, but there is that feeling uh, on that cusp of adulthood. He's 19 now. He's, he's basically an adult and the life that he wanted, the adventurous fun lifestyle of youth is, is, is fading. And he, there was so much he wanted to accomplish. And the cool thing about this, Matt is we know we, the readers know that these things that he's saying, he is going to accomplish. He's going to visit these places. He's going to do the dragon's run. He's going to do all these things. We know this, but he does not. And, and that, and, and there's wisdom in that knowledge too, though. It's like, he, he's he's aware that he I was in too much ma- haste and now I have no time left. Like, I, I ha- this is what I have to do. I must go where I am bound to go now. I have responsibilities. I have destiny. I have all this, and I must go now. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a beautiful moment. Mm-hmm. And now we have to talk about about women. <laughs> in this story, which is not going right. to be a very long conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe this is the uh, the part with women in it. Yes. Um, so they sailed on their narrow course over the wide forsaken waters. The most they saw that day was a school of silver panties swimming south, but never a dolphin leapt, nor did the flight of gull or murre or tern break the gray air. As the east darkened and the west grew red, Vetch brought out food and divided it between them and said, Here's the last of the ale. I drink to one who thought to put the keg aboard for thirsty men in cold weather, my sister Yarrow. At that, Ged left off his bleak thoughts and his gazing ahead over the sea, and he saluted Yarrow more earnestly, perhaps, than Vetch. The thought of her brought his mind and sense of her wise and childish sweetness. She was not like any person he had known. What young girl had he ever known at all? But he never thought of that. She, was, she is like a little fish or minnow that swims in a clear creek, he said, defenseless, yet you cannot catch her. At this vetch looked straight at him, smiling. You are a mage born, he said. Her true name is Kest. In the old speech, Kest is minnow, as Ged well knew, and this pleased him to the heart. But after a while, he said in a low voice, you should not have told me her name, maybe. But vetch, who had not done so lightly, said, her name is safe with you as mine is. And besides, you knew it without my telling you. So women in a Wizard of Earth sea, Matt, um, <laughs> don't have too much of a presence. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it, it is. Int- I think it's portraying something about this character because like, like the, the parenthetical is basically it's basically Le Guin looking at us and saying, like, the reason why he's he's enamored with this girl is that he's never talked to any girls (laughs) 
Right. Well, and and I think this I think this says something of of him becoming a young man too, because there there are other women in this book. Um, there's one, I mean two, but they turn it out to be the same person. There's the little girl that tricks him into reading the book uh, when he's trading as a young boy, and she grows up to be the sorceress at uh, uh-huh. at the the court of Terra is it Terabor, whatever. Terabithia. D- don't forget the. Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's I think it's Terabor. There's also the witch who who teaches him his, his first magic. Yeah. So we've got witches, sorceresses who are basically witches, <laughs> and then this girl who he likes. Yeah, but so this is this is the interesting part because if you think about this, if you if you plot this out in the, the life of a boy growing up, um, first you have this this girl and you're like, for some reason you're like into her and you you do something stupid to impress her um but but you learn that she tricks you and there's like there's this idea that as you as you go through adulthood women become less of tricky things that are just there to manipulate you and trick you into doing stuff you don't want and more become things that you're interested in and i think that's Uh the path we're seeing here because every like the only other woman he's ever experienced both times was specifically trying to trick him because they were related to an enchantress and were trying to enchant him. This is a woman who has no powers um, at all. She's younger than him. I think she's only 14 here, She's, but she has no powers and he sees in her something he's, as the author admits, has never, he has never seen or never noticed another person before, another woman before. And this parenthetical is like the only time in the book that this is done. This is like completely unique. I don't think the author speaks to us in parentheses any other time in the story. Um, yeah. So that's like really important. Yeah. But right. I think like I think it's very easy. You can look at this and say, "Huh, Ursula K. Le Guin, why didn't you not put more women in your story?" Um, and it's like, well, because she chose to tell the story of uh, the 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 coming to adulthood of a man. And so I don't know the other books in the series, but I expect there will be more women in them because he's no longer a little boy that goes, ew, cooties. I don't like girls. Um, and has learned, yeah. and this is, this is like the hint of that. That's hint of adulthood that now there are things I want besides just power. This girl is very interesting to me. Um, yeah. And yeah, and the fa- like, the, his his connection to her is pretty explicitly stated here because he guesses her name. Like that's a that's a powerful connection. Yeah, and I believe you're right that that the some of the other RC stories even have female protagonists. Yeah, so. I'm not surprised by that at all. Yeah. Okay. So it's time we got to we got to end this. Okay. Ged stood up. So. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. I was. Uh, you, you go ahead. Yeah. Ged stood up and took his staff and lightly stepped over the side of the boat. Vetch thought to see him fall and sink down in the sea, the sea that surely was there behind this dry, dim veil that hid away water, sky, and light. But there was no sea anymore. Ged walked away from the boat. The dark sand showed his footprints where he went and whispered a little under his step. His staff began to shine, not with the wear light, but with a clear, white glow that soon grow so bright that it reddened his fingers where they held the radiant wood. He strode forward, away from the boat, but in no direction. There were no directions here, no north or south or east or west, only towards and away. To Vetch, watching, the light he bore seemed like a great, slow star that moved through the darkness, and the darkness about it thickened, blackened, drew together. This also Ged saw, watching always ahead through the light. And after a while, he saw the faint outermost edge of the light, a shadow that came towards him over the sand. At first it was shapeless, but as it drew near, it took on the look of a man, an older man, it seemed, gray and grim, coming towards Ged. But even as Ged saw his father, the smith, in that figure, he saw that it was not an old man, but a young one. It was Jasper, Jasper's insolent, handsome young face and silver-clasped gray cloak, and stiff stride. Hateful was the look he fixed on Ged across the dark, intervening air. Ged did not stop, but slowed his pace. And as he went forward, he raised his staff up a little higher. It brightened, and in the light, the look of Jasper fell from the figure that approached. It became Petchvari, 
but Petvari's face was all bloated and pallid like the face of a drowned man, and he reached out his hand strangely as if beckoning. Still, Ged did not stop. So he's confronting the shadow, and the shadow is becoming all the people from his past, all the people that he has abandoned or wronged or left. Yeah, or, or the people who he perceives have wronged him yeah. and who he has some reason to to be spiteful against. Yeah. Um but uh but he he doesn't he doesn't take the bait. He he at this point he either understands its nature or he's close enough to understanding its nature that he's not going to be swayed. Yep. He just continues to walk forward. And that's yep. where we got the the final confrontation. Yep. In silence, man and shadow met face to face and stopped. Aloud and clearly, breaking that old silence, Ged spoke the shadow's name, and in the same moment the shadow spoke without lips or tongue, saying the same word, Ged, and the two voices were one voice. Ged reached out hands, dropping his staff, and took hold of his shadow, of the black self that reached out to him. Light and darkness met and joined and were one, but to Vetch, watching in terror through the dark twilight, from far over the sand, it seemed that Ged was overcome, for he saw the clear radiance fall and grow dim. Rage and despair filled him, and he sprang out on the sand to help his friend or die with him, and ran towards that small fading glimmer of light in the empty dark of the d- empty dusk of the dry land. But as he ran, the sand sank under his feet, and he struggled in it as in quicksand, as though the heavy flows, as though a heavy flow of water, until with a roar of noise and the glory of daylight, and the bitter cold of winter, and the bitter taste of salt, the world was re- was restored to him, and he floundered in the sudden true and living sea. So, so Vetch goes to help him. So, so first of all, he he realizes that the shadow is him, and he is the shadow, he names it, and they they join, and then Vetch comes to save him, but falls into the ocean because it's not really land. Yeah, and isn't it interesting here, we kind of walk back from Ged's perspective here at the end. Mm -hmm. We kind of, the story becomes as told from the perspective of his friend Vetch, which is something different that for for most of the story, we've been pretty firmly fixed on our protagonist. And here at the end, we don't hear his thought process. We don't, we're not there with him in him. When he comes to this realization, we are watching it from afar. And I think it's really interesting that, that, that Le Guin chose to tell it that way. Yeah, I'm not even sure exactly why, because like it, there's not even a paragraph break here. Like the the climax of the story is essentially light and darkness met and joined and were one, and then the next sentence is start starts with a conjunction, but to Vetch, like like you're like it kind of takes the wind out of the sails right. of that moment, right? And it has to be intentional. Mm-hmm. I'm just not sure why. I, I feel like I feel like this this decision is so. Um, important and key to get and get alone that the book almost walks back from it. Like it doesn't want us party to it. It just, this is, this is Ged's moment. This is Ged's decision. This is Ged's realization. And this is Ged becoming a man. And that is an intensely personal experience. And he, the, the Gwyn pulls us back from it and lets him have that by himself. And we are with Vetch the this the observing this happen okay yeah interesting i don't know if that's right but that's, that's what i feel yeah no i mean i i think i think you could probably come up with a few different plausible explanations i hadn't thought of that that, that makes sense cool but now we get to see what's going on because ged is pulled back into the boat and he says Estereo. He said, look, it is done. It is over. He laughed. The wound is healed, he said. I am whole. I am free. Then he bent over and hid his face in his arms, weeping like a boy. Until that moment, Vetch had watched him with an anxious dread, for he was not sure what had happened there in the dark land. He did not know if this was Ged in the boat with him, and his hand had been for hours ready to anchor, to stave the boat's planking, and sink her there in the mid-sea, rather than carry back to the harbors of Earthsea the evil thing that he feared might have taken Ged's look and form. Now he saw his friend and heart and heard him speak. His doubt vanished, and he began to see the truth, that Ged had neither lost 
nor one, but naming the shadow of his death with his own name had made himself whole, a man who knowing his whole true self cannot be used or possessed by any power other than himself and whose life therefore is lived for life's sake and never in the service of ruin or pain or hatred or the dark. In the creation of Ea, which is the oldest song, it is said, only in silence the word, only in dark the light, only in dying life, bright the hawk's flight on an empty sky. That song Vetch, Vetch sang aloud now as he held the boat westward, going before the cold winter, cold wind of the winter night that blew at their backs from the vastness of the open sea. It's beautiful. Yeah. Ged had yeah. neither yeah. lost nor won. He, it, it wasn't about winning. It wasn't about being stronger or more powerful. It was just about accepting you, making yourself whole, making yourself who you are, this, I mean, this is, this is everything. This is the entire book summed up in a paragraph. Yeah. And, and, and this is one of those areas where like, I, I do, I do feel like part of the reason many authors write, and it's a very valid reason is to sort of throw out a life preserver to, to other people who may be in situations where they need it. Mm -hmm. And very often, you know, especially when you're writing fantasy, you're probably writing fantasy targeted at a younger audience. You know, this yes. book is probably targeted at a younger audience. And this is, this is a much more like, this is a very healthy view of, of, of what it is to be a man or, yeah. or an adult for that matter. Just like it, it puts certain struggles into a more healthy perspective, yeah. I think. And yeah, it's very abstract, but that, that's the point. That's why you tell it via a story. And, and that's why this is the, the climax of the story is yeah. you've, you followed this character on his journey and you've seen what he's had to deal with and you've seen, the resolution of all of that and it's not a sword fight where he stabs something in the heart and it, and it burns and he declares his victory it's this much more humble thing that you can actually connect to and and try to understand and it's not something that you would naturally understand without this you know life preserver of, of narrative yeah yeah this idea that the, the mistakes you have made the things that you've done the evil that you have wrought throughout your childhood is a part of you is mm -hmm. is part of the whole you and that is being an adult is realizing the the disparate parts of you and understanding them and knowing who you are accepting who you are and and living life for life's sake i love that i love that whose life therefore is live for life's life's sake and never in the service of ruin or pain or hatred of the dark if you know who you are you will never be taken over by forces that you don't want ruin pain hatred or the dark as long as you know who you are and live life for the sake of life these forces cannot take you over cannot control you cannot defeat you and that's that's beautiful that's that's yeah. that's i mean yeah i mean i can imagine a, a 14 year old me a 16 year old me reading this book and and gathering strength from that sentiment, that idea. Yeah, I think so too. Although, although I'm, I, I'm not sure how much of my liking of this is caused by me, like filling in the details with my own life experience and, and being like, what she means here is that you need to understand your own capacity for evil and, you know, your, your own capacity to have become a, concentration camp guard or whatever if, un, 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 under under the right circumstances you know in, in order to not you know you have to understand that part of yourself in order to make sure that that never actually happens she doesn't say that here she's she's more abstract and artistic and mythic but but i feel like that is what she's saying um i'm not sure if i would have gotten that when i was a kid yeah uh, that's yeah i mean that's fair that's fair and I'm not even entirely sure that's what she's saying, <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, I, I, the, the thing we keep going back to this, but the thing about myth is that it'll, it is so kind of broad and, and paints with such big strokes that I think it allows you to fill in the details from your own mm -hmm. life there. I think that's why I like mythic storytelling is because 
it, it exists in this place where you can take your own personal experiences and your own uh, struggles and, and trials and tribulations and, and fill them into the creases of this story and make it all the more meaningful to you. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I, I like that. Yeah. It's the uh, applicability that Tolkien talks about. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. So finally, the end. If Asteriel of Ifish kept his promise and made a song of that first great deed of Ged's, it has been lost. There is a tale told of the east reach of a boat in the east reach of a boat that ran aground days out from any shore over the abyss of ocean. If Ifish, they say, if in Ifish they say it was Astariel who sailed the boat, but in Tuk they say it was two fishermen blown by a storm far out on the open sea, and in Holp they say it was a Holpish fisherman, and tells that he could not move his boat from the unseen sands it grounded on, and so wanders there yet. So of the song of the shadow, there remains only a few scraps of legend carried like driftwood from isle to isle over the long years. But in the deed of Ged, nothing is told of that voyage, nor of Ged's meeting with the shadow before he ever sailed to the dragon's run unscathed or brought back the ring of Erith Akbe from the tombs of Atuan the Havnor or came to the last, or came at last to rope once more as archmage of all the islands of the world. And I admit that when... I was I was audio booking it. <laughs> I was not I was not looking at the time. I was doing something else. And I was like my brain was very surprised that the story ended right here. Of course this is the perfect spot for the ending, right? Mm -hmm. Um like the, this was the story. The story was his his growth into into adulthood and fusing with his dark nature and and there was no other adventure to be had here. Um yeah. but I was still like, "Oh, that's the end." Oh, wow. Yeah, I could see that happening. I mean, I, I could tell by the percentage on my Kindle, but um, yeah. So, what do you think about this idea that the, the 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 deeds of Ged, the story of his life, does not include this? Yeah, because my interpretation of that, and again, I don't know if I'm right or not, is everybody fucks up as a kid. The things you do as a kid don't define you. And the things that you will be remembered for are the, all the things you do after that. So yeah. if you mess up, if you do bad, if you hurt people, um, that doesn't have to be the defining story of your life. Yeah, I guess I like that. It depends. Yeah, I'm I mean, trying, don't murder I'm trying to people as a kid. That's bad. Don't do that. Yeah. But like all of the... Um... Like all, all the biographies I read, uh, all, all of the biographies that I've read, definitely, y you definitely get something from the people's early life, and it, and it varies depending on who you're reading about. But um, it usually focuses intensely on the like great deeds of that person. So if you're just being very like analytical about it, it makes sense that if the deed of Ged was a biography, essentially then it would focus on his great accomplishments and yeah. victories and, and the, the, the types of stories that are like more, I don't know, just, just more, uh, fantasy ish hero stories. Mm -hmm. Just, just, uh, whereas this is a rather complex metaphorical journey where, yeah, he fights some dragons, but actually his victory over the dragon consists of just telling the dragon not to cross a certain line. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it, it doesn't, it, I, I guess it very self-consciously doesn't make as good of a sword and sorcery story because there is no, there is very intentionally no stabbing the flaming sword into the heart of evil. It's, it's not that kind of story. And maybe, maybe what she's saying is like, thus it doesn't make its way into the fantasy epic version of Ged's life. I, oh, I like, I like that point because yeah, like the whole, this whole idea is how come we never hear what gandalf did as a mm -hmm. child now gandalf's a little different i understand that but let's just st stay with me here yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. how can we never hear be because because that's not the big interesting tale but that makes it no less important i like that i like that interpretation i like that better i think cool all right 
Uh, Trinkard says, for what it's worth, I did read this as a teen and remember not liking it. Don't remember how much I got out of it then. I loved it on this read as an adult. And yeah, like this is one of those things where I wish I could go back in time and see what what younger me thought of it because um, I would probably be like Team Ged throughout most of it. Like, yeah, Jasper sucks. He's yeah. like Malfoy, right? This is the Draco yeah. Malfoy of the school. Yeah. There's also also the ending. Like I I remember st- stories that that I even books that I liked, I would get so mad if the ending was not like fighting satisfying in that particular, like ego, uh, massaging way where the hero wins, gets the girl, kills the bad guy. You know, like if, if, if it was an ending that was saying something, I would be pretty annoyed with it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That does like I, the books I read as a teenager, if they were fantasy, they had fighting in it. And if they didn't, I was annoyed. (laughs) So yeah, I think, I think you're right there. Um, Tringard, I think, agrees with you here, Matt. He, he says, um, it means that everyone that remembers him remembers him as already being wise, careful, and studied, more of an archetypal hero instead of the real, which is exactly true. We yeah. remember our heroes as the, their perfect versions of themselves, not yeah. not as as humans. Right, like we meet, we meet Aragorn when he's, you know, 80, yeah. right? And you know the, the young and you almost don't want to know the young adventures of aragorn because it's like oh i mean he probably just was like a normal person and then he just became wiser and stronger and better yeah and and yeah I mean, oh you don't want to know the young adventures of aragorn uh, just... because amazon's gonna make it happen for 500 million dollars <laughs> no i don't <laughs> oh boy okay so q a time <laughs> Sergey <laughs> remembers <laughs> remembers it as liking it as a kid, but but remembers it wrong. <laughs> but liked l- likes his version better. What, I'm I'm curious. What's what's the what do you think is the moral message of the book that that disturbed you or that I, that I put words in your mouth? Sorry that you didn't like. that awkward time where we have to wait for the stupid lag it's okay try to try to fill the silence just with humming hey matt you're coming you're coming here tomorrow yeah yes i am sweet i'm trying to decide if i want to go to work tomorrow or not (laughs) (laughs) it's gonna be a tight morning tomorrow when do you get in uh i get in at i get to the airport at er, around two is your mom picking you up i guess uh, i was probably gonna uber to uh somewhere okay i think my mom's probably busy with other stuff yeah that's true if you need if you need a ride or anything appreciate that just let me know i'm all the way on the other side of the city but i i, I can drive places okay okay um do we want to just let's we'll wait for the questions or we'll, we'll reveal the book away wait for questions to roll in how's that sounds good yeah do you want do, do you want to do the honors i will do the honors so um I, if you were joining us for the first time we said at the beginning that we let people vote we let our patrons vote on the books they want but uh we decided that like every so often maybe once or twice a year um for one of these months we're just gonna let We're just going to let ourselves pick it. We're just going to pick something. And Matt and I were looking through all the books that we've done, and we realized that we haven't done a science fiction book yet, Matt. We've never done science fiction. We've done a a fair amount of fantasy. We've done a mystery book. Um, We did a horror book. um, But we never did sci-fi. So we felt like it was time to do some sci-fi. So go ahead, Matt. I, we, (laughs) have chosen... (laughs) Uh, the Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein. And that, and, I, I, and, uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, um, you know, I, th- this is a book that I've heard. Um, uh, Heinlein is controversial, but I've heard from so many different sources that this was a, a really good book um, that 
and and I, I it's always been like on my on my list and I I figured I probably wouldn't read it unless unless we did it for book club so I figured that would be a good um a good choice for book club it's been it's been recommended to me many times yeah I think I think this is going to be interesting I I I have not read a lot of Highland I know enough about him to know why he is controversial but um this is this is also a book that I hear is pretty good. So we'll yeah. see. I, I like diving into controversy. I think it's I think it's good to read authors that are controversial, um, even if you might not agree with them. Yeah, or even if you don't end up liking the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You don't it's like good to read. I, it's good to read propaganda. Just lots of different propaganda. See, I like. I, I think when I was talking about the when I was talking about the, him murdering the, the child dragons, I mean, like, I don't think the book is making a moral call on that. I don't think so. Like dragons in this world are bad things that, that murder people. It's like, it's like you getting bent out of shape for people killing orcs in Lord of the Rings. Like nobody, nobody cares about like orcs. Orcs are representative of evil in that. Like orcs don't even have a backstory in Lord of the Rings. Like, so I, I don't, I don't think that the book is saying that he's immoral for killing the dragons. I, no, I, I don't, don't think know. I don't think the book is saying that either. And greed and pride are are not good. <laughs> Tringard has always put off Heinlein. Yeah, me too. Well, so I, I have read, let me check that this is by Highland before I open my mouth. Yeah, so I read Stranger in a Strange Land when I was in high school, and that is a weird book. Um, honestly, I, I don't, no, I, hmm, interesting, I was going to say I don't recommend it, and then I realized that I don't remember it that well. But the Moon is a Harsh Mistress actually sounds like a much more normal science fiction book. It doesn't have any like weird pseudo mystical stuff in it, mm-hmm. as far as I know. Um, so I might be able to process it a bit more easily. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. I mean, you, you're right. The, the, your morality is for you to decide, not for the author. But when you're reading fantasy, I think the, the the morality of the world is established. Like dragons are bad. <laughs> yeah. It's especially a story like this where like the metaphysics of the, of, of how the magic works and how the universe is put together is actually tied into like what is morally good by definition in the story, mm-hmm. which I guess you could complain about that in, in and of itself, but that's a trope that you see absolutely everywhere in in fantasy yeah and i don't necessarily think it's it's good like i don't i i actually think tolkien's handling of the orcs is one of the more questionable parts of his story and i think he himself actually regretted it a little bit um if you read some of his his later writings like he he tried very much to flesh out orcs in a way that um made them more than just mindless evil things but also didn't want to take away the heroism of the people that were slaughtering them so it's like this it's like this tough thing right because like orcs in that thing are bad right like they're they're bad and like characters talk about like like slaying orcs in that world is a rite of passage i remember like the first time the hobbits slay orcs aragorn's like ah you got your got your first orc good job and yeah everything gets complicated. The images of your heroes get, get way complicated when you start diving into that quagmire. I mean, I think the, I think orcs are, are like literally by their nature, just like horrible things. And it's, it's almost better that they're dead. I mean, that's the stance (laughs) the book takes at least. Well, yeah, I think that is what, that is, that is kind of what, um, what Tolkien decided, right? That like, these are things that as long as they're alive, they, they're corrupted lives that cannot return, um, that, that, that are 
like are doomed to wander the planet, the earth forever. So by killing them, you're actually freeing them from this terrible curse of existence. Yeah. yeah. Like e- even their own society is just like backstabbing each other all the time. Yeah. yeah. That's a, it, that's a stretch though. They remind me of, of like a, a kid in a clones where it's like, yeah, you can probably, you, if you squint at it, you can, you can find a way where it's tragic that this thing has to be killed, but it does have to be killed. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, since we ran really long because of me, um, we're going to go ahead and and wrap this up for the month. Uh, Thank you so much for all of you guys that tuned in live. It's always fun talking to you guys about the book. Um, I love when we have differing opinions on the stuff. Uh, And I I suspect, Matt, we're going to get a lot of those next month or at least very passionate opinions. I hope. Yeah, Um, I hope so. Yeah. If any of you are listening uh, to the on the on the podcast on the audio version of this feed maybe come hang out next time sorry we had to do it thursday this this month it's a little weird but we will be we will be back on friday next week friday april 27th at 9 30 p.m we will be reading or, or or covering the moon is a harsh mistress by robert Heinland. Heinland, uh come come read it and, and hang out yeah uh if you like what we do here at the daily planet and want to see more of it head on over to our patreon at patreon.com slash daily planet films and consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. You get access to our private Discord server, as well as the ability to vote for which books we cover and tons of other cool benefits. Check it out. That's right. If you have any questions or comments or just want to reach out to us and, uh, and say what you thought about these books, you can find us uh, on Twitter at Daily Planet Films or email us at dailyplanetfilms at gmail.com. That's it for the book club, guys. And we will see you all next month. Uh, sorry that went so long. <laughs> it's okay. I uh, had the opportunity to suggest fewer slides and uh, take that opportunity. Yeah, that's all so your fault. That's all your fault. It is. It is all. So my I'm fault. gonna. I'm just gonna. From now, next month, I'm gonna put a cap. I'm gonna say 25 slides, no more. Sounds good. This kind of like our. Yeah, this one was 37. Like our, 37 yeah. slides. 37 is a lot. And the funny thing, it was a lot. And then I was like, ooh, I want to talk about Murr and I want to talk about Yarrow. So I added those two slides like an hour before we started. So I made it even worse. Yeah. You, you brought us out of equilibrium with nature. I'm sorry. In, in order for there to be podcast, there must also be not podcast. What? <laughs> well, tomorrow we're going to not podcast. So I don't know <laughs> what the true. problem is. That's true. <laughs> That was, I thought that was a good discussion, though. I had fun. Thank you guys yeah, for, yeah. for hanging out. Yeah. Great. Very. It's always fun when the chat is active. Mm-hmm. Sorry, it was Thursday. It was. We had no choice because next week I'm out of town Friday. Matt's out of town this Friday. There was just no other way around it. We're not releasing this tomorrow, are we? No. Okay. In that case, I will probably sign off so that I can go to sleep so that I can wake up and pack. Okay. If you can just get the, your audio over to me before you depart, that'd be Will great. Will do. I'm going to make a note to do that. Okay. All right, everyone. All right, guys. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you. Yeah, see you see next you. month. Yeah.